You may be busy doing something while you listen to this podcast, but you're never too busy to eat healthy if you eat Vite Ramen. This podcast is sponsored by Vite Ramen. Show support for a sponsor that supports Moore's Law is Dead at the link in the description. And if you do, make sure you use offer code Broken Silicon. And you can also support Moore's Law is Dead if you need Windows keys or software at cdkeyoffer.com. If you go there, also use the code Broken Silicon for 25% off Windows keys or Die Shrink for 3% off everything else on the website. All right, now let's get on with the show. Welcome to Broken Silicon, a gaming hardware podcast. I am your host, Tom, and today I am joined by uh, someone who seems to come on maybe twice a year, at, uh, every six to ten months, I would say, you come on the show. And so there will be a link in the description to the last episode. That one's was, I, I don't want to say a slow burn because it did well at first, but then it just kept doing well every day forever that happens with a lot of guest episodes by the way i think people yeah. just noticed i did video and they're like oh all of them are video now let me go back and watch these and yours was one though that still burned way brighter for a longer time than most people and hopefully that'll happen again but you know it's because you're a game developer that is really interested in hardware to a degree that i don't find in a lot of developers and so you have this unique ability to talk about Frankly, everything we're interested in on this channel in all departments, whereas most people, it's graphics, it's CPU, it's server, it's it's what makes a game well programmed. You know all of it, um, but please, it, even if you know if someone hasn't seen the other three times you've been on or something, please tell people how you would describe yourself and what makes you interested in the things you're interested in. Yeah, I, I mean, I've always been like even working on games with gamers and with uh, game developers and stuff, I'm always known that I'm pretty obscure when it comes to that. It's just unlikely that someone that's because my job's primarily been art. So for me to be that interested in technology and willing to talk to devs about what it is they're doing and when they're doing optimize optimization passes or whatnot, I ask them what they're doing and I'm interested in the process, how you get advantage of more hardware, but I've worked in the game industry almost 10 years now. I've been, uh, art directing for two, and you, you're the lead art director now at Massive Damage Studios. Well, you I'm the weren't. only art director, so I'm the art director. I was the. You I, didn't have to correct that. Just say lead yeah, director. Yeah. Sure, I'm the lead art director. I do uh, art direction. I, I talk a lot of devs. I do. I've done everything in games in terms of visuals and implementing visuals and stuff at some point in time. So that's part of it. But my interest kind of lies. I've loved games my entire life. I've loved art my entire life. And I loved the type of games that really realized the potential of hardware. Like ever since growing up, that one game you play on SNES or PS1 or N64 or whatever, GameCube that blows your mind and pushes the hardware in ways you didn't think were possible. That always like just triggered questions in me. How'd they do that? What's going on here? Why does this look so much better than this? Why does this game do this and this? And uh, I think that those general obsessive tendencies have kind of brought me to where I am. You know, why do things, uh, and yeah, I think I'm, uh, I'm curious about that in a similar way, just very differently professionally, you actually make the games, but in this vein, I remember, it's such a random thing to just remember now, but like asking one of those questions, why is this the way it is? I think I was like in daycare <laughs> before I was 10 years old. I, we lived in Chicago back then. I went to this place called Kinder Care and... They had, they didn't have a PlayStation, they had an N64, but my cousin had a PlayStation, and I remember PlayStation games always had voice acting, mm -hmm. and I remember N64, almost every game, I remember me and this other guy, just like, a uh, guy, other kid, making fun of someone playing it, because someone would talk, and they just go, wah, 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 and then they just have the <laughs> list, and we were just like, God, they're so lazy for not just recording someone's voice, and then it's like, now I know. No, the cartridge held thirty megabytes. They yeah, yeah, yeah. they didn't record any voice because they they couldn't, you know. And it's that type of stuff. Like every gen, I feel like a lot of people are like, "Well, why did they cheap out on that?" And it's like it was probably for a reason. Yeah, and I'm like, I don't know. I'm probably 
five years older than you. I don't know how many years older than you I am, but for me, like bringing up PS1 and 64 of Tony Hawk, it had the animated videos with the video playback on the screens when you went around in the game. And yeah. then on the N64, it was just the track. And even that was like cut to shorter loops and stuff like that. But the colors, the polygons were much nicer on N64. Yeah, though. there's advantages and disadvantages both ways. I'd have to look at the comparisons of that one again to know, but... Yeah, it's, it's always been kind of interesting what goes into games, what compromises they make, how do they make them work. And, um, you know, I was when I was a kid, I did a lot of messing around with games, how they're like I did pot editing and stuff on Warcraft 2 back in the day, making my own sprites and stupid things like that. So just little things messing with games and how they work. And then, you know, eventually having to make lots of games and do stuff for them. So. Well, King Harkinian writes in and asks, how is your pixel art so good? No, really. How is it so good? You know, I'll ask too, it, it, you're allowed to be proud of yourself. All right. What, 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 what do you think? Why, do, why would you, how would you describe why you think the art you do is good? I think you've done this long enough where you're like, yeah, probably above average at least, right? Like, like yeah. what, why do you think your art is better than most people though? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, too, because the pixel art, I, I hadn't, I mean, I did when I was a kid, I remember doing Icon Master and making my own icons and stuff for my own games. Oh. Like, I made my own King's Quest icons and what the dig and all the LucasArts adventures and stuff when I was little, um, and then making assets like that. But Because I, I was just obsessed with, like, making maps for, like, Far Cry or, uh, yeah. you know, Ray, well, before that, Rayman. Uh, but, and, and I never thought, well, what about just making different parts of it prettier. I was like, I, I want to make a castle we can <laughs> shoot people in. Yeah, one of my best friends, I used to just draw, we made up our own game ideas all the time and just drew stuff for it and put it together like that. But in terms of pixel art, it's like all of my education was just traditional art, traditional whatever painting and digital painting after that. And then pixel art, I was kind of blindsided because Halcyon 6, I came in and I took over the back half of the game. So they had half of the art assets done. And then I was hired and I had to get like knee deep in pixel art for the next however long to finish that game. So I, I hadn't done pixel art in forever, like since I was a kid and I had to learn it all on the fly for that game. And, but I've always been obsessed with art and games. So for me, if you ask them like, Oh, I want to do this. Like I want to do it like this effect in Castlevania Donosaurus or like this one and Metroid zero mission. Like I have a, a vlog of games in my head where I have visuals in mind that I'm referring to. So it's like your own kind of reference bucket. And I've just, and so, and now I haven't done pixel art since star renegades because the games we've been working on since then haven't been pixel art. So I, I miss it to some extent, but I still do it for personal stuff and people seem to respond to it. I have a pretty decent following on Twitter now. And, um, but I, I guess it's just mostly if I don't have you mean image, X, it's not Twitter now. It's oh X. Gosh, I'm just no. kidding. I don't want to <laughs> keep going, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. But, uh, yeah, for me, the big thing is if I have an image in my head now, Sometimes I just won't go to bed. I'll just stay up until I do it. <laughs> I'll be like, oh, I really want to do this for this. Or, oh, this game's coming out and I'm excited about it. So I want to do something based on it. And then I just do it. And then you get cool moments like Hideo Kojima retweeted a Metal Gear tweet I did. Oh, yeah. And um, other stuff like Square Enix tweeted one I did for Nier. And that was just, you know, weird bonkers stuff like that that happens. And if you never did art for fun and pushed it out there, then you would never get those kind of reception or interactions with your work and you know when i first did it you would do like i remember the first time i made an image that went kind of viral out of my control and i was really anxious like it, it was so nerve-wracking because it was in reddit forums and people were finding in places in the was internet. it the lisa sue one no that one went viral afterwards the first one was the crying titan one that was one of the in-game images that was the first one that and it was the number one on pixel art on reddit and then all of these people were talking about it and i was so anxious because I, I it was the first one i'd done like that i didn't know if i'd be able to do one like that that did that well on all the social platforms again but once i, I don't know eventually it got to a cadence where it was like one in three or one in four of them pretty much blew up and then i didn't really have to worry about it anymore it still keeps you on edge. You have a lot of people interacting with your work. You have a lot of people thinking about your work. And 
And then I'm known in, in different capacities, right? Because now it's just an aside to what I do. Like I don't do any pixel art at work anymore. It's just a fun thing I do. But, but were you nervous because you were concerned that it was it like several layers and like the bottom layer was really you're just worried if you'll be able to do that again? Is that what made you anxious or just like people will see this and expect more from you or like, why do you think that made you anxious? Yeah, I think it's the first time you do images that really resonate with people. The imposter syndrome hits really hard. It never really oh. goes completely away. And I think it has something weird to do with just mastery outright. The more you master something, the more subconscious the processes become. So the f you're literally becoming less aware of it as less aware of what you're doing while you're being more aware of what goes into it. And yeah. that that seems to mess with people quite a bit. I completely empathize with everything you're saying about making videos. Like, it, yeah, you know, before we started recording, maybe we'll touch on it in the future again in the recording is I looked at a video I just put out about NVIDIA halting production. I put out a similar video about Ampere and shenanigans with that. I'll tell you, I was worse at editing back then for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Even though I think by 2021, I was significantly better than 2019. It, it, I can still go back and look and go, oh, I, the, I way, way, way better at making this now. And then back then, still some of those videos would blow up and I would just go, oh, I don't know if this one really deserves it. Like, why? You know, <laughs> I, I completely, I think anyone who's introspective can empathize with what you're talking about, like imposter syndrome and just the better you get at something, realizing the things you could do better, you know? Well, and just how much of your time it will take to get any better yeah. too, because I, you know, I always say this to people when they ask me and they're like, oh, you do what you love. And I'm like, I always said that I would get good enough at art at one point in time that I'd pick up the guitar again. And there just never seems to be an end to how good you need to be at art. So, <laughs> no, I, I, I know what you, I know what you mean. Um, well, you know, actually, um, what's something I was going to bring up too is I, I think I can just answer it. I think this is usually the answer to like, why are you good at pixel art? Well, people get interested in games or in art and they focus on different things. You were focusing on making pixel art for fun at a younger age than most people. Like they go like, why is Dave Chappelle so funny? He was doing stand up since he was like 16, I think they say. Yeah. So it's like, well, you got the hours of work in before everyone else and you formed your brain at looking at things and building them in a better way. Longer long before other people i think yeah, it, it always seems to trace back to that like games plus limitations are always interesting i kind of love the otherworldly nature old games have that new games lost to some extent because on nes you were like forced into a terribly crude color palette and then you just had to pick like extreme complementary colors so you had to do very specific things and an example i usually use is if you play like Mega Man 2 and 3 you're like on space in some other dimension and then you put Mega Man 11 and you're on earth as a robot and, yeah. you know, the, the technologies in some ways reduce the imagine, amount of imagination. It's not saying that it's not possible, but... Well, it made you focus on parts of the imagination, and there's like a freedom in being limited. Like, you brought up Metal Gear Solid, that was created because of hardware limitations. 100%. You couldn't have too many people shoot on screen at once, and he's like, well, what if you were trying not to get shot? <laughs> and then, oops, fun. You know, people like that much more. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, thanks for uh, the compliment on the pixel art, but uh, well, it don't, it was King yeah, Arthurian. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, but uh, yeah, thanks for that. I realized sometimes that one of the one talks, someone asked a question, they like they said they got into games because of a talk I had with you, and I'm like, I should have said thank you. Why didn't I say thank you? Oh, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I, I it's. it's it's the the amount of times you see comments like that. I think I think they know that, uh, especially with the humbleness you're showing, that you can't imagine, like you know, how appreciative you are to hear that and stuff. But yeah. well, let me move on. I, I I actually didn't format the GPU part of the discussion as much as I used to because we always tend to meander all over the place, and so I thought, like, what? Why would I even bother? Let's just get. I put them in somewhat of a coher coherent order. Yeah. Let's just start with this one from Compressed Earth Blocks. Brian, I, I'm just wondering, how do you feel about this generation of GPUs in general? I myself find Lovelace overpriced and the VRAM on most of the lineup is frankly a joke. But on the AMD side, I found a RDNA 3 to be slightly under what I was expecting. 
it has kind of ended up being a boring generation for me to watch compared to what I was hoping for a year ago. What do you want from the next or the next, next or next, next, next generation of GPUs for gaming? And are you disappointed by this one? Um, I'm most disappointed by the RAM. I think having cards that are theoretically more powerful than consoles that underperform in specific areas because they're being so, um, I guess, limited in terms of how much RAM they have. I have built a uh, 4090 system and I built a 7900 XTX system. In NVIDIA's lineup, the, the increased gap between the 4090 and the rest of the stack is what bothered me the most. Mm-hmm. I think the 4090 is a very impressive card. It's really interesting. It's crazy powerful. It's really fun to play with. Um, but the gap between that and 4080 is like the largest gap I can remember between a nine, like the, the highest tier and the next down tier card. It's around 40%, if we're being honest, especially if you throw in ray tracing. It, it's about 40%, at least 30 yeah. It's like 16,300 shaders or something like that in the 4090. And what is it in the 4080? Like Just under 10,000. Just under 10,000. So yeah, it's like a 40% reduction in shaders, which is like well, physics. 60%. 60%. <laughs> but I think it's closer in memory bandwidth and TMUs and ROPs. I would have to yeah. look up the specs that kind of equalize it, but it's it's crazy. And then the, the memory, 24 gigs and what is it, 10 on the 4080? Uh, 16. 16, sorry. 16. It's the 40. Which one goes down to I'm trying to think of the first one that goes down in memory from there? Well, from there, it goes down to 12 gigabytes, then 12, then eight. Then so, eight. yeah. yeah. It, it, and it's weird because you would think it, there's always like awkward areas. Uh, actually, someone I talked to at NVIDIA said they almost made, well, there were two versions of TU-106, so for Turing, yeah, the yeah. RTX 2000 series. There was a 192-bit version, but they said, we need to make both the 104 and 106 die have 256-bit, because 6 gigabytes just isn't going to be enough. Yeah. And it's a little disappoint. It's very disappointing that they didn't make that same decision again, right? Yeah. And the, it's odd. The favor in like, the actual forward-thinking games things will use more resources, more programs, more applications are using more video memory. And it doesn't make sense in that climate to reduce the amount of memory across your product stack or have such a big gap in memory on them. So that was disappointing on NVIDIA's side. On the Radeon side, I've like having played a lot with a 7900 XTX lately and, if, and having the opportunity to play on a 4090 or a 7900 XTX, 90% of the time, the difference is so negligible between the two. Mm-hmm. sometimes there's games that individually favor them like i was playing exoprime when i think it felt better on the radeon for some reason but it was pretty close on both but there it's it, you always get this when you go to a new architecture like what is it i was just i just did a die shrink with dan who's the usual co-host on the news episodes he is the xtx right now and he said that in some games it seemed like, I don't know, twice as good as his 6700 XT. But for some reason in Deep Rock Galactic, it tripled or more performance. And you always run into weird stuff. And I, yeah, and I found in Call of Duty, it outperformed my 4090. It's the exception, but it does in that game. And that's uh, like just hundreds of frames. It's weird. Yeah, there's there's a lot of things that are pretty interesting about RDN E3. I don't think it's like a fully... It's it's not a missed opportunity. I mean, it still beats a 4080 for the most part in raster with the you know 7900 XTX. And if you have one in your system, it's still crazy fast. It's an insanely powerful GPU. But you know, in terms of what I was hoping for, I was definitely hoping for it to be about 10% more powerful. I would say somewhere between 10 and 15% more powerful. And I was hoping ray tracing would be closer, but Having when I went around GDC, that was something I actually asked AMD and NVIDIA engineers about, and I they had some interesting. I'm not going to say which side or who said it, but I got the implication from a bunch of them that essentially ray tracing was kind of being sabotaged across specific games and ecosystems because of how much of a disadvantage it posed to Radeon. So the thing is, is apparently if you only count if you only uh, shoot the amount of rays necessary per pixel for what is visual perceptibly between them you there's like 
NVIDIA still wins by like 10, 20%. But if you just shoot until the pixels run out of energy, more or less, Mm -hmm. NVIDIA loses a lot of performance, but they beat Radeon by like 2x, 3x. So it's very similar to Kepler versus GCN with tessellation, where practically they can both do the same image quality, but if you crank it up, Kepler can do tessellation like twice as well as GCN 1.0 could. And so there are games like Crisis 2 where they would just tessellate things off screen and leave it in the game. And well, I mean, that certainly hurt NVIDIA's performance, but not nearly as much as uh, it hurts uh, AMD. And then they look better. It's actually a similar thing happened in Metro 2033 as well back then. Yeah, I remember the exact example. It wasn't uh, how many razor shots. I don't know, but the, it was about material roughness. So one of the engineers was telling me that if you did it based on roughness of materials, because if a material is very rough, the light's basically diffused across the entire thing. And then if you reduce the rays shot per pixel based on roughness of object, there was a massive equalization in performance between the two. It was still in NVIDIA's favor, but that essentially games, I don't, I don't know individual devs that have said this. This is just from engineers working on hardware that I was talking to that we're mentioning that this is a potential reason why Radeon would not be as bad at ray tracing in some specific games and be mm-hmm. significantly worse in others. Yeah, and I, 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 have, I have a couple of minds about it because there are plenty of games, and to the people who will shout this in the comments, not just games where it's software ray tracing, but there are some newer games with ray tracing where RDNA 3 seems to perform just as well as Lovelace, mm-hmm. but... If you crank it, I, I still I still was kind of hoping there'd be more of a focus on ray tracing with RDNA three than what they've ended up getting out of it. Or do you think do you think that's a silly opinion for me to have? Do you because you know I always thought I mean it's definitely better than Ampere, but I always thought that they I always heard too that they were probably at least on paper, especially with the early presentations before benchmarks came out. It looked like they made a lot of changes that should make it much closer than it ended up getting when you crank up ray tracing. Now, I don't know if from your point of view, that's just a silly way to look at it. Like, you know, that why would you put more effort into that's necessary, you know, in the architecture for supporting ray tracing. But I'm still a little surprised when you crank it up, how much they lose by. Yeah, well, I think it's like, this is just me guessing uh, based off of the hardware because NVIDIA, it's basically a separate block and in Radeon, it's attached to, is it type of the... Mm -hmm. Is it ROPS that it's attached to? Uh, it's like per, well, yeah, I think so, basically, but per CU, like just yeah. every CU has it, yeah. Yeah, I think it's part of the, but I think that the it's just the way that it's going. There's more potential with Radeon for conten- contention of resources when it's doing it. So that would make sense why the heavier you get, the less able, like the less it would actually work as well like i don't know i would have to look more into that i'd be curious but i would need i think it'd be really interesting to have a benchmark or whatnot that has parts of it turned off used for different things turned off specific like if there was a benchmark that went whatever like uh two rays per pixel for mm, you 16, could literally do it that you granularly could, yeah. you could see where they they if one falls off or one doesn't or they can you know show wave 32 versus wave 64 versus whatever it is optimizations that they can do to make radeon specifically run better and um or whether it's partially that a lot of the plugins a lot of the things if you go into unreal you know and you're implementing ray tracing in game there's a good chance that you're interacting with an nvidia plugin to do it which is very helpful for game development. I don't know if it's helpful for the level playing field, but very useful in terms of making games quickly, right? Well, you know, here's an interesting thought too. Since RDNA 3 has come out, there's actually been a few driver updates that have boosted ray tracing performance Mm. for RDNA 2 Mm. by like 20 or 30% across the board. And I can't help but wonder if that's, something to do with development on the consoles learning tricks to optimize it better that are then applied kind of across the board on pc and if we're not really going to see rdna3 get its ray tracing well optimized until the playstation 5 pro comes out yeah, or something. Pro comes out and it's using the architecture and then people are learning to talk specifically to it yeah i, I can see that scenario it's it's interesting because i know that um when i was at the like at uh, GDC and I talked to some AMD engineers, they mentioned that 
one thing they do in their game optimizations is manually change game code and change the wave fronts. So mm. that that's one aspect, it's one knob they turn when they're doing a game ready driver driver for a specific game to improve performance. And there's a subset probably of things that they know will improve performance. And they probably did learn a lot of it from the consoles and trust trying different things, testing things, and then determining what's better, when can we bring them into like when can we if they're not best practices for mm. game developers, then they may be able to catch them in the driver but they may not necessarily always be able to catch them in the driver and they may not be able to instill it as best practices. So how do you target some of these things perfectly? It's a little difficult. It gets to be a bit of a messy territory. I guess because I brought it up, let me just ask, like I've always heard, well, I shouldn't say always two years ago, I basically heard that Sony and actually Microsoft had developed a concept overall design, what they would look for, for pro slash elite consoles and yeah. kind of what i've been hearing is like eh, the design's there but they can't even keep the ps5 in stock why bother mm. it's starting and i i don't quite have all of the specifics yet but it's starting to sound like at least on the sony end, they've given the green light for the ps5 pro next year um i'll probably know for sure within a month but i guess i'm wondering like do you have any thoughts about what it sounds like if it does come out it's going to be some kind of rdna 3.5 slash 4 hybrid which three kind of seems like a if i'm being honest an optimized and fixed rdna 3 yeah um, with probably with some of the ray tracing enhancements of four is what it's sounding like what and it kind of sounds like it'll be at least twice as strong so you know i don't know something with a much better architecture that's better at ray tracing it's about double the raw performance Sounds pretty similar to PS4 Pro, to be honest. Um, yeah, more fixed uh, function, though. Exactly. So what do you think it really needs to do to be, I mean, not even just successful, but interesting to you late next year? Well, if they don't do anything significant on the CPU, they're going to be limited to visual updates because I do think it's the cache and other things that are holding back games from really reaching high frame rates on PS4. Five specifically, so which means that if they keep the piece, the architecture for the CPU very similar, I think they're going to go to Zen Four. I do think they will go up or to some Zen 4, four to five hybrid, probably with still some things from Zen Two, so it's backwards compatible. Like, but higher clock speeds, and it will have higher IPC than before. Which I don't know that they need that much stronger. It's at like three point four gigahertz now. You go to past four gigahertz with a, I mean. 50% higher IPC by now or something, right? Like, yeah, that's probably enough to get to 120 Hertz stable. Don't you think over what they have now? Yeah. If they, if they had an increase, especially if they did the, if they adjusted the caches, if they increased the cache sizes for the CPU, did it more like, um, what's the most recent laptop releases that are, uh, dragon range, X. dragon range, because those do seem to be pretty good at getting that pretty high frame rates and laptop and small form factor. So, but I don't know how much die space they take up and whether they would have the silicon real estate to implement that much cash and whatnot. So my guess is that like an, a ray tracing mode, like increased, increasing the size of the BVH, increasing what is in it, like improving things in that way would probably be the easiest thing that they could do. And devs are already kind of making a bunch of features that they can scale up, they can increase the resolution of reflections, they can pull in more global illumination. And it would be more visibly noticeable, to be honest, if the difference between the PS4 ver PS5 version and the PS5 Pro version was whatever, global illumination. That's a pretty massive mm. difference. So, you know, it could be something like that that they end up doing. But I think that they would need to be minimally at least twice as powerful for any of that stuff to even be on the table. Yeah, actually, that's... That's a good point because I, I just don't think talking about 8K, which certainly some games may have an 8K mode on it, but is really going to get them any extra sales. I think saying the PS5 versions like 1440p60 and this one has ray tracing on and is at least at 60 or 120 and closer to 4K, that'd probably be just far more noticeable than trying oh, yeah. to do something with 8K, you know? Oh, I... I like going from 1080p to 4k was a big jump because you went from like certain sizes tv having issues with being perfect and the other thing is it eliminated the pixel grid so part of it wasn't the resolution you were seeing it wasn't increasing res resolution but part of it was seeing less distance between pixels that improved how 4k looked to us 
so much. Going to 8K isn't really bringing that benefit. And then when you go, yes, it can be noticeable, but typically on TVs like plus 70 inches. So unless you're playing on like a theater or your entire wall, the mm-hmm. feasibility of, of 8K isn't really... And even still, why wouldn't you just do like What's SSR be more and DLSS up to 8K from whatever it is? If you have a bit more resources on that front and we improve the scaling algorithms, it makes more sense to cover the pixel gap using those, which can be a contentious issue. But I'm just saying, especially from 4K to 8K, because we all know with DLSS and FSR with this much time, the higher the resolution is, the mm-hmm. less noticeable it is. So, and game devs across the board will probably tell you, would be my guess, and this is, I don't want to speak on their behalf, that 1440p is kind of like the golden land of what they want their actual pixel output to be most of Mm -hmm. the time. Better than 1080p, worse than 4K, but from 1440p doing some kind of temporal upscaling to 4K or 8K or whatever is... It lets us make much more of the graphics. If we focus on 4K as the actual pixel output, then we're going to have a lot harder time getting the visuals to the standards we want, and we're going to be making a lot more compromises as we're making the games. Mm -hmm. Getting out and enjoying the weather, or is it too hot to get outside? Well, either way, whether you're looking for an easy meal on the go or something quick and delicious while you're cooped up inside, Vite Ramen has you covered. This piece of content is brought to you by Vite Ramen, Vite Ramen is a healthy, tasty, and shelf-stable food crafted by an American startup that offers tons of options for eating healthy. Their classic packages make it easy to add protein and other ingredients of your choice, including new flavors like Radiant Crab Ryu. And also, their Ramen Go packages offer a healthy microwavable option for those who truly only have a 15-minute lunch break away from home. Or they even have other healthy products like Nano Boost Powder that makes any food at least a little healthy click on the link in the description and use the offer code broken silicon to save 10 percent on a variety of products including special bundles from moore's law z fans raw nudes if you want to make up your own recipes and other food products powders cooking utensils and more they are a plucky small but rapidly growing company that has been good to moore's law is dead for years so you know supporting them helps support me and even just clicking on the link below makes a big difference for moore's law is dead but I really do like their products, and I recommend you try them as well. So check out Vite Ramen today. Really? Gonna keep the glasses on for more than a minute? Well, so QH Freddy writes in and says, Which direction do you think we should go with resolution and FPS? Currently, a lot of games tend to cap at around 150 to 200 on modern CPUs. The mid-range GPUs can... P- push close to those frame rates at 1440p. Do you think the mid-range, next gen, should try to get to 4K and the high and even higher end than that should go higher? Or do you think games should just try to deliver much higher frame rates at the same resolutions that are standard now? So I guess he's kind of asking, do you think, that, and maybe it's even just marketing, the focus should be on making the mid-range $500 cards do 4K 144 like the 4090 does now? Or just 1440p to 40, <laughs> and then we focus on 4K 240 at the high end. Like, which way should it trickle down? Do you think? It's 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 going to be both. Like, you can't have. It, what game are you playing? If let's say whatever, I make up a game off the top of my head, but like Metal Gear Solid Six comes out and it's going to be amazing, and Kojima's back on it or something. What, like, just making up garbage, and you're obsessed with that. If I would want that game to be pushing for visuals more than anything else. So for me, frame rates out of the question, but if I'm playing newest shooter or whatever multiplayer online game, then I'm going to want as high frame rate as humanly possible. So these are two streams of what games can be that are moving slightly in different different directions. From I mean, each it's other. just pixels at the end of the day, right? Do you want the pixels spent on more frames or the pixels spent on a higher resolution, right? Per se. Yeah. Or, and, or do you want bigger, better visual features merit, like pulled into your entire game so that you, basically it's going to be harder and harder to push those pixels there's way more being done to them before they get assembled so you can't actually use them that way like we what did we see we saw the first major unreal 5 game ship recently revenant 2 came out and that only uses nanite it doesn't even use nanite and lumen when you mm-hmm. use nanite and lumen simultaneously like for most PCs, like 80 or 90% of PCs, almost 60 frames per second is off the table. Almost. 
And then if you do anything unique for your game, when you're building whatever your gameplay features are, so those things use power, use processing too. How many enemies you have on screen? What kind of idea are you doing? All of those things use more and more resources. And the base performance level of that engine is such that super high frame rates are off the table unless you you end up and use one or the other, use Nanart or Lumen, then 60 frames plus is back on the table. You use both 60 frames per second currently doesn't seem like it's that on the table unless you go really low resolution, right? And this is- Yeah, the, you've been sending me a lot of, every now and then in like offline discussions, like charts and benchmarks showing that like the next gen um, game engines really are crushing hardware. Like yeah. to get to, and they're and they're basically getting to photorealism though. The next game engines, it's just man, they even crush a forty ninety from what you can see. Yeah, well, it's visual hardware pushes when you play in Unreal. I, the funny thing is, you can make something that looks really gorgeous, but it's amazing the frame rate difference per resolution doesn't change that much. Mm -hmm. You gain. It's not like whatever you're playing. Um, Oh, I'm trying to think of a game like even Exo Primal running an RE engine. You drop resolution on that, you gain like 70 frames per second. Or you, you know, you go from 4K to 1440p. Suddenly you're over 200. Go down even more, and suddenly you're over 300 frames per second. It's not like that with UE5 games, from what I've seen. You drop resolution, you gain a little bit. Well, and just then to give some input too, like my rule of thumb that I've noticed is on most GPU architectures, uh, it, going from 4K to 1440p tends to almost triple frame rate. Not not quite, and this is before you factor in DLSS or FSR, then yeah, it's yeah. actually not that big of a deal. And then going from 1440p to 1080p, it like doesn't quite double your frame rate, right? Because And that's almost in line with the amount of pixels. It's like, because 4K is over double 1440p, so it's like, all right, so you would expect your frame rate to at least be cut in half, and then going yeah. from 1440p to 1080p, you'd expect a 50% boost. Like you're saying, going from 4K to 1440p is almost like Alchemist with most games. You yeah. don't even you don't even gain double or triple the frame rate. You you only gain like a 40% boost or something. And it's it's probably because your CPU and I like I I worked in Unreal Five for the last year and a half ish, and when it's <laughs> It's you're so CPU bound. Like Nanite and Lumen are both so resource intensive already that you just you're bottlenecked everywhere. You bottlenecked your storage. You bottlenecked through I/O. You bottlenecked in memory, and you bottlenecked on your CPU. Like all of these things are being pushed to the limit. So, in, including the GPU. So it's it's currently the next gen visual push is making it really hard to optimize and i want to get into optimization in a bit because it's really four things we call one and um do you think there's a chance though this is because we just need holistically next gen systems pcie gen 5 faster ddr5 zen 5 or arrow lake and then also a PCIe Gen 5, which actually is showing up as a thing in Ratchet and Clank too, like the PCIe bandwidth you have on the GPU to be able to stream in assets. Do you just think there's just a bunch of little bottlenecks all over our current systems in a next-gen system with like Arrow Lake 5090 Gen 5 latest SSDs? RAM is going to maybe make these transitions between resolutions and next-gen engines more like what we see now, but we just can't because there's a bunch of little bottlenecks everywhere? Or do you think this is a more fundamental thing that will be worked out over the next five years? I was in the, I, you know, because I was sending you messages during it, but I was in the AMD um, GDC talk about, uh, was it direct storage mm -hmm. and all of that. And the situation seems to me to be this, and I, this is just if I say things wrong, I apologize. But it seems like currently on PC, the way that it works is that in most DX12 without DX without or Vulkan without direct storage games, it's five copies to one on PlayStation. So the memory is is copied to main memory. It's decompressed by the CPU back to main memory and through to the GPU. Then another thing happens to it. I can't remember. I sent you a picture of it one time. Yeah, they actually went through the diagram. It's five copies to one. So. In, in on the PS5, it goes straight through to the ASIC to decompress and then store it in the one memory where it's accessible by both the GPU and the CPU. So the amount of copies between the two is is always going to be a bottleneck. And there will be a point where the speed's so high on those components that it's comparable to what the PS5 is doing. When we have whatever 
13 gigabit per second um, N.2s that everyone has in their systems and, you know, so much, much faster RAM and all of these things where you won't notice it'll be enough to cover up those issues with that bottleneck. But currently it's the way that I see it is the, the disparate nature of PCs, the fact that this GPU is this, and then your memory is this and your CPU is over here. And then they're passing data between all of them all the time. And you have the storage over here and it's going in a cycle. It's very inelegant compared to how something like the PS5 currently works. Mm-hmm. And the PS5 has the ASIC for decompression compression. So now we're not, we're talking about also an additional lack of needs to contest for resources while copying the data, because as soon as you're copying the data, then you're engaging, you're using CPU cores for IO or you're using your GPU for IO. And when I was at the talk too, they talked about, I went to an NVIDIA talk about this and an AMD talk about this. And it looked like it could be up to 20% of resources for a split cycles when using direct storage. So now we're talking. And that's G- what they found in Ratchet and Clank. It's literally around a 20% hit to GPU performance because some people have enabled and disabled it. Yeah. And yep, it's, 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 Exactly that, around a 20% hit to GPU performance if you use direct storage. If you don't use it, they think a super CPU can pick up some of the slack. Yeah. But you better have that super CPU that the consoles don't have. And it is interesting to see it proven now, what you'd said before, that it was like a 20% hit, or they said. Yeah, yeah, they mentioned that it was a 20% hit. I, I, I said in the last, I think it was the last one or the one before, I don't remember. But I said that, well, then you're doing GPU, and then what happens? Now you're taking you know, resources away from the GPU. It's, it's just, you know, and this is, it's interesting because, you know, I think we're going to hear a lot, a lot of conversations when these UE5 games hit, when next-gen engine games hit, and the word optimization is going to be thrown around a lot by gamers wanting better performance, and rightly so. Like, they, once again, I'm on your side, they, you definitely want better performance, but optimization is really four things, or maybe more. Four things I know of. One of them is you're just doing something wrong in the game. You're not using an instruction set you could have used. You built something in an inefficient way. Let's say you were using SSE instructions and it runs way faster in AVX instructions and you can change it to it and it's just free performance. That's one type of optimization. Another type of optimization is reducing quality of assets, sometimes imperceivably. Let's say you have whatever, volumetric Mm. lights. Sometimes you have volumetric lights at 64 times and you drop it down to 16 times and 2% of people notice then you're like, well, I gained all this performance and nobody cares. That's great. Sometimes those things cost more performance than that. And sometimes their their visual compromise is much greater than that. And you have to make decisions on that. Sometimes you have bottlenecks in one place and you're choosing to move them somewhere else. You have some system that's built up and it's using a bunch of CPU time, but you're CPU bound all the time with what you're doing. All of it's coming through. You have, oh, it's, you know, you're getting way too many draw calls. You're, you're hammering the CPU too hard. So you're like, well, we can move this to a GPU based solution. And what happens when you move it? So you might have whatever, I'll use it. An example, let's say you... You have like a specific type of object in your environment. You want to interact with it in a specific way. You have like a a cool tool that interacts it and you can dig through it in certain ways, let's say. And in uh, a CPU-based solution, maybe it calculates on the surface and then it picks how many points and it picks how many points apart and then you can do it through that. And on a GPU, maybe it renders to a special buffer where you have another camera that runs at much lower resolution than the other camera. So now you've moved it to that, but that creates a whole new array of bugs because... And that means you have to retest everything. So you've moved something from taking CPU resources to taking GPU resources, which is a type of optimization. And this kind of ones happen early in development, but they can't happen at the end usually because you just right, have to retest just everything, everything about it. Yeah. Yes. And then the final type of optimization is just knowing the hardware perfectly, knowing what the gamers are going to be playing on it, and then moving to resources that are fresh that are, are just something that there is no contention for resources. And you can do stuff like that if you know exactly what gamers are going to be playing on. And if you don't know, it's much harder to target them. So gamers use the word optimization. Like, it's this one magic thing that makes games perform better. But yeah. from the dev side, it's sifting through these potential things, seeing which one to use in this setting, which are the easy wins, which are the unnoticeable wins, where are our mistakes, and playing through that. And, and I would say there's no game with a reasonable team size like as soon as you cross 20 or 30 people that has spent no time on optimization all of them have spent time on optimization it's just whether or not there was a system that they developed that ended up being much heavier than they intended 
And if you're talking UE5 or things like that, maybe the visual standards and the engine standards are already so high that it was going to be really hard to even try to do your idea. And maybe in that case, it would have been better to do it as a UE4 game where you have a lot of performance overhead and it wouldn't look as pretty, but you could do your idea and then you could get your high frame rate version of the game. But you can't do that partway through development. Once you've made the decisions and you've started developing, you're not going to downgrade engine on your game. Yeah, so, I think they say that happened a lot with some EA studios uh, with Frostbite. It's not that Frostbite isn't a good engine or can't do everything. It's that they were basically mandated by on high. You have to use Frostbite now. And all of their assets and systems were designed for a different engine. And yeah. then they just realized they had to basically rebuild everything, which delayed everything, which caused tons of issues. And you're saying this is probably going to be a huge thing in the next five years where it's like, maybe you should have just used Unreal Engine 4. Maybe you really shouldn't have gone mm-hmm. to 5 yet. You know, Maybe you shouldn't have gone to 5.2. <laughs> maybe what you're trying to accomplish on this one console, like the next Nintendo console, really isn't meant to use that engine and forcing it to use it was maybe a mistake if that's what it's going to run on predominantly. And then there's just all different types of instruction sets and a lot of new instruction sets coming out with upcoming CPU architectures. And it's like, there, there's, there's any overabundance of minds in this minefield pretty soon about what could cause a game to be unoptimized. And yeah, you just try to outline what's probably causing it, but it's like four different things. Yeah, I want, we're we're unfortunately like right at the probably the worst point we could be at in terms of perception of it because mm. because we were on PS4 for the last while, and because PS4 and Xbox One CPUs were so like lightweight. Let's just call them that to be nice. They game developers and and gamers got used to the fact that they could just play a game that was released for PS4 and they could play it at like six times the frame rate on PC. Like it was nothing because you're literally playing on a CPU six times more powerful and or more. And that makes a lot of sense why you'd be able to run it like that. So we got used to the fluidity brought by super high frame rates in games. So now the next console generation having beefier CPUs that we're going to start using for other things. Mm Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, like like Nanite and Lumen and these systems that still, and, and ray tracing at the same time, because ray tracing increases your BVA, now you're building BVA structures, which use more CPU resources. So it's a CPU bottleneck as well to turn on ray tracing. And it's, it's not all GPU. It's, so because of that, it's going to be a heavy transition period as we increase the visual standards, because frame rates are going to drop pretty dramatically in line with them. And then we have to recalibrate after that. And there's always going to be, along this entire process, there's going to be games and game engines that are lighter weight that you can have high frame rates on, and they're better fits for specific games. And it may be an advantage that uh, first parties face compared to third parties, because you know, third-party studios getting your own engine and getting a game up and have it be impressive is a much harder thing. But for companies that have somewhat lighter weight engines that they can work with. And if they're making a really beautiful game, they can just pivot to Unreal. But if they know multiplayer is involved, if they know this, they just keep with their in-house engine and then they can give people high performance frame rates. And this is like a lot of times when people are like, well, this game and this, the first thing I ask is, well, what hardware is it on and what engine is it using? And then you can start to sift and think what could be problems from there. But, you know, and context what api is it using all of these things are additional context for understanding a specific scenario of how something should could or would perform you know it's it's funny to think back like it was like what has a probably a video i made in 2020 where i was talking to some people um i don't remember if they're i don't even remember anymore if they're at sony or people who worked i, I they're probably people who worked with people at sony uh and they were talking about how like Everyone's talking about the PS5, like the point is like to do everything theoretically faster. And well, they're trying to, uh, a lot of it just was, I, they wanted to make it so, and, and Mark Cerny talked about this publicly eventually, uh, we, we can't let games have seven year dev cycles. So if we can do anything in the console hardware to make it so 
instead of going from two years to three to five year dev cycles, we keep it at four, maybe. Yeah. We'll make more money because we'll release more games. We'll release a game every four years and we'll have less headaches. Yeah. And you have to wonder if like there was part of it where he was looking at like the mountaintop of where we're going to go next and was thinking, this is going to be a nightmare if we don't simplify everything for everyone. Like because of just how much is about to change. It's it's interesting too, which games and you can you can probably run a correlation between engine tech and ease of use and and release cadence. Like look at Hideteki, you know, probably butchering it, Miyazaki, the director of all the Souls games. Like they've had their in custom their in house engine that they've been working with forever for Bloodborne and like they use the fire engine or something like that on the ps3 where that was like a sony spinoff engine but since then they've been kind of doing their own engine tag with bloodborne dark souls 3 elden ring sekiro Mm -hmm. and they've released more games as one developer but then like you know Mm. gta missed a generation right like and some jank some games miss a generation we got you know one uncharted one last of us we got three uncharteds on ps3 and it's that's an interesting that. point. Like they're used to using the Elden Ring engine yeah. and it used to kind of suck, but it's at least okay now. And it, because they're used to it, it does what they need. Well, they can still get out a game every two or three years. You well, know? It's that it doesn't seem to, I mean, I'm not going to praise their engine left, right and center. It definitely seems to, you know, uh, uh, stuttering yeah. and all of these things, but people seem to overlook it on the masses and then they can just focus on making their intended next game. Where Sony is a little tethered because they've been so tied to visual standards for so long that the expectation is always visuals will rise with their next release, and they're yeah. they're a the little next bit- Uncharted has to look better than the previous Uncharted, which was kind of crazy back then because it was like three needs to look better than two. You're already pretty close to what it's going to look like, and yeah. next God of War has to look better than that. The Last of Us Part Two has to look better than The Last of Us. Yeah. Yeah, so they're kind of they're trapped in their own fate because they're known for pushing standards of like pushing up the standard of visuals. So I don't know. I, th- I think that all of these things kind of come into play with figuring out what people should do with hardware, what you should do with your game, and it, with smaller devs, they're going to be more eager to try to impress over their weight, which will tempt them to use newer technologies that might be harder for them to reach with visions that like with the performance and whatnot that they would like gamers to experience it at, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's... so some random penguin writes in and he asks, Hi, Tom and Brian. What are your opinions on games being designed with upscaling required? Remnant 2 has been getting some flack for this recently, but I predict that more developers are going to take this approach in the future. And actually, I talked about this with Dan on the last Broken Silicon, and My opinion was, well, first, Dan pointed out Remnant 2 really does seem to not give you a lot of visual bang for your buck. But I said, I'm just going to sidestep the specifics of this conversation. I don't know about Remnant 2. I don't care to comment on if they did a good job. And just say that if they actually do impressive visuals, I don't care if it requires DLSS and FSR. It just Mm. should look impressive for the frame rate you're getting. And however they get there doesn't bother me. It's just, I would hope that it's for a good reason, you know? Yeah, I think it comes down to exactly what I was just saying. It's it's engine-based. Those devs that are using, a lot of UE5 games are going to be shipping with these things based to try to cover the performance gap by just enabling Nanite and Lumen. Nanite or Lumen, or and, and or, You know, that's going to be the big thing where you absolutely need to have you. It's not that you need to. It's that once again, the base performance cost is so high of these things. And then whatever they add to their game on top of that, like what is it? I think I sent you a while ago, the uh, the tech demo, the most recent UE5 tech demo. And I think it ran at like Mm -hmm. 50 or 40 frames per second across like almost every GPU. So it looked gorgeous, like it looked absolutely amazing, but the, the base performance cost before you add your game is so high that it's hard to, to pull off these things. So to me, it's a tied to visual standards and tied to dev resources. Do you have access to a lighter weight engine that is a better fit for you? If, you're, if you have a custom engine or if you have a, like an absolutely amazing group of render techs on your team and maybe you can pull off your own engine... 
that would be best case scenario because then you can minimize it to whatever makes sense for the game and you can have it be a lot lighter weight and still look pretty good. But a lot of other devs, especially as visual standards go up and it's, it's the exact same thing that happened with fabs with the, Mm. the, the harder the process node got, the more fabs dropped out of existence or just said, Hey, I'm just going to do these other things instead of making the newest cutting edge Silicon. They're still cutting edge there's still like 50, 50 different things that whatever little modules for things and tons of parts that still require 14 nanometers. I don't need to jump to this. And you saw throughout the years, less and less studios making less and less, sorry, fabs making Silicon at whatever sizes. And it's the exact same thing in terms of devs and making their own engines. Devs used to make their own engines most of the time, but as the visual standards continue to push up, they're left behind and it would be so much harder to build that engine from scratch. So the vast majority of them are pushed to use whatever the current standard is with all the strengths and weaknesses that come with that. Well, so, but this is kind of leading me to want to ask this question then. And let me say kind of a suspicion of what you're going to say too. Do you think what Unreal Engine 5 is trying to accomplish with Nanite and Lumen and asset streaming as aggressively as it is, is maybe so heavyweight that it's a little ahead of its time? Like it works and theoretically it reduces the amount of effort you need to put in. Uh, can I mean, the idea that like you're shrinking polygons to the amount of pixels on screen is a great idea on paper, but it really requires everything to be again like holistically optimized in a ring to get to that theoretical just halo idea of like everything shrinks in quality on the fly through streaming per pixel i imagine it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation we this is the future anyway so doing it now will mean within 10 years we'll have the best engine and everything will be built on it and it'll work well then do you think it's chicken and egg, or, or do you think it might honestly be a little too aggressive for its time, given the hardware we have? Yeah, I mean, it is probably a little aggressive, but I, I mean, Epic has literally the best, probably the best render techs on Earth. They have a lot of them. I mean, other places have really good ones too, but they hire a lot of the best people on earth for all of this and they're doing things. And it's the reason we're seeing it early in their engine compared to everything else. And they want to be known for showing that stuff early because waiting doesn't really get you that advantage and draw as many people to working with you because they make their money Mm. by people using their software and people use their software because it, it is the future now. And that's, got its strengths and weaknesses, right? And maybe you're right. It shouldn't be now. And it's definitely wasn't ready to be now. And it was like 30 eighties in most people's computers or 10 sixties. Like then it's just, well, the expectations they set up, right. Where you could run the unreal engine five demo on a PS five or on your PC. And it looked really cool, but it's pretty much an extreme version of a walking simulator. So maybe it set unrealistic expectations of how smoothly it will work in real games. Yeah. Well, it's, I don't want to, it's definitely amazing. It's just the, the hard thing. It's not that we can't make games that run well and 30 and 60 frames per second or like 30 frames per second is on the table pretty much all the time. And 60 frames per second, it might be on the table depending on your game idea. But, and then maybe if you had a really lightweight game idea, that's using primarily their tools, you might be able to find some way to optimize once again, those four different paths of optimization to getting to like 120 hertz or whatnot on it, but you're probably not going to see 240 hertz or anything like that. Like there might be some paths for some really smart devs to do some things like that with UE5. But But for the foreseeable future, you're saying if you want to build an online multiplayer game at high frame rates, probably use four actually. Don't use five. Yeah, if you want frame rates, high frame rates to be on the table, that would probably be the case. But then like devs are competing unless you're part of like a huge triple a studio then you're competing for funding most of the time and you always have to kind of press over your weight to try Mm. to to get those resources so it's not really it's it's weird because you have different forces pushing you to different things and it would be ideal if money was just there and you can pick whatever is best for the game but you you do have to wow some people along the way to yeah, be to able keep to money coming in. You, yeah, exactly. So it's um, it's that balance between making the best version of your game idea, wowing people along the way, and to be honest, most artists and whatnot are excited about the newest tech. Most 
you know, there's, there's something about getting people behind it and then they're feeling like they understand systems that if you stick behind on old systems too long, then what happens when, you know, uh, some game project comes up that you'd be working on, then you feel like archaic yourself because yeah. you stuck for a games development cycle on something old. So that means you waited another five right. years. So now once it is good, are you going to be the last person to learn how to use the latest tools? A hundred percent. That makes actually, that makes it, that makes a lot of sense. A lot of, because these are people that work at these companies. They might go, no, no, no. I want to learn how to use Unreal Engine five. Otherwise I'm stuck at this company basically, unless you're someone like, you know, from software, you know, you're working on Elden Ring where they're not going to question him. They know the next game is going to be good. Yeah. That's a very unique situation, though. That's not uh, most studios. Yeah. Um, Swiggles writes in and asks, hey, Brian and Tom, how much optimization is actually done for an architecture or a specific series of cards in general? Is it mainly moving values around to make the game easier to run on any similarly capable card? Or is it more just understanding what a specific type of card does best and changing the math or type of effects you do or, or programming uh, accordingly. Yeah, it's probably like, I, I'm going to say that like with stuff like this, I speak mostly out of studying lots of games, talking to devs from other studios and, and just that's where my understanding and experience comes from all of this. So, but as far as I'm aware, it's a lot of the time, um, there are specific things you might find that you might find that your API is blocking you from doing some of the optimizations you've done on console. You might find that you just don't have resources. And the other thing is if your frame rates are already pretty high, it's hard to get resources pointed. A lot of times it's not that you games are studios with lots of people, with lots of resources and they're pointed in different directions, but there really has to be problems sometimes to get the right amount of attention on mm -hmm. something. So, Usually, if things are already running well enough, you end up in situations where it's not going to get focused. And if you ask people on the team, they're like, yeah, I knew I could have done that better, but there was no way we could get this to look at this because this system was burning over here. And whenever people went over here, they teleported over there. And then we had to do that. Like, there's, it's, it's usually stuff like that. They, there, sometimes there's known issues. And every game developer, when they ship a game, they have a list of bugs that they didn't get to resolve. Yeah that were just, they happened so infrequently, or it was everything else was so high priority, or it only happened in very specific situations. And it's like only one person in the company's computer caused this problem out of 40 people working on this game. We tried fixing it for six hours, 12 hours one day, and then someone said, please, you can't do that anymore. We can't afford this. Move on to something else. Like those things happen as well, right? And in bigger studios, I don't know what it's like with the AAA and how they handle those specific types of scenarios, but I know what it happens at a lot of small to mid-sized studios when they're focusing on these things. And there's really, there's, there's two types of optimizations in this front. There's stuff that can be caught in drivers later, like I said mm -hmm. earlier, that like changing your wave fronts from one to the other. I, AMD engineer outright told me that they did that when they went through and did their game ready drivers for specific games, you know, right. stuff like that. There's certain things they know that they can just do. And then devs can somewhat rely on the GPU manufacturers to AMD or NVIDIA. Yeah. To work with them on that. And then there's other things where, um, yeah, you, you want to try to catch as much as you can, but you're always going to be blindsided by a, a pile of these whenever you ship and then you have to focus on them then there's too many games on both i've, I've flip flop amd and radio uh, mv and nvidia for gpus for whatever like 15 years and i've had to hit steam forums for games not booting on both of them enough times and, it, does, and then, it happens less often now though right it does it, it, well, a decade time, ago man I think the last time i hit it was the whatever my fighting game from so there's a fighting game that shipped and we wanted to play and it didn't work on one of the vendors it was like a year or two ago, but anyway, that was that was like every that that was like every fourth game like fifteen years ago. <laughs> like it, it's actually what made me switch from Fermi to HD six thousand series is I could not get some games to work on my five sixty Ti, and then there were but it still every now and then happened on AMD where like eventually I'd get it to work, but I'd have to do some really ridiculous trick to get it working or sometimes the trick just reboot just try to launch it reboot try to launch it reboot and then some file will finally install correctly or something that was a thing i would do too it doesn't really happen to me that much anymore no my my loyalty has been like 
heard on both sides so many times over the years from when I went, I think it was Jade Empire. I had, I was on Rose Radio on something like 9,000. I can't remember the number of it, but it didn't render characters. It was just the environment. And I was like, wait, I was going to wait like <laughs> six minute, months for a patch. And then I switched to GeForce for the next one. And then I had a GeForce, I think it was a 400 series or a 500 series that was overheating like crazy mm-hmm. and giving me tons of issues. And I'm like, I just don't trust anything in terms of like perfect reliability. I've had bad driver experiences across everything. Like at some point, not consistently and not in the last however many years, but I've definitely hit bad No, drivers. I've never had a... Con- There's been... Every now, I've I've had good luck with NVIDIA recently. Yeah. RDNA One's launch had a bad patch. Every fifty seven hundred, yeah, the yeah. Yeah. that borked everything, including Vega, which was cool. Um, but you know, <laughs> you know, Florida man writes in and he says, "Hi, Tom and Brian. AMD seems to have dropped the ball on day one drivers for Ash and Clank. Ray tracing just wasn't available on AMD GPUs for some reason, and AMD also showed poor rasterization performance compared to other titles around then." How early in game development does AMD typically get involved with driver support versus NVIDIA? In Ratchet and Clank's case, would you suspect that AMD were low on driver personnel to help? Or did they just start working on game-ready drivers too late? Like, what would actually cause a game to launch without working ray tracing support? Which I think they just updated today, and it works, by the way. That's really interesting. Yeah, I thought that was really surprising, considering that, obviously, they had built it around rdna ray tracing right because it had ray tracing on the ps5 what the hell yes but i will say like having seen ps5 ps well playstation ports of games the workflow is so different the api is so different it doesn't matter if you're utilizing features in in certain ways you basically are rebuilding materials and everything when you're switching when you're doing things for sony so when you're switching over there is a lot of potential for things to go wrong some like Unreal and Unity, their big thing is trying to like abstract that from you as much as humanly possible. But Nixus would be dealing with like native code from Insomniac's engine mm-hmm. for that. So there is more likely to be issues with things like that when they're moving. I'm just I'm guessing once again. Like this is just speculation on my part. So take it as that. But if that was the case. I would assume that just once you switch the API, once you switch your materials, you switch all of these things over, there's certain things, something's not happening right in the BBH structure. It's not really doing it the same way it was doing it on PS5, despite the fact that it's the same hardware. So, and from my experience with um, like talking to NVIDIA, Radeon engineers, all of that, to some extent, they've been available as soon as you're ready to call on them, but you might not realize you have a problem until it's too late as well. And that probably was what I'm guessing is the case this time, or you end up with really weird things. Like currently with our, my, the game that I'm currently working on, uh, I have the 7900 XTX and something about what DLSS just having it installed, try to do is not working on that GPU at all, but Mm. they bought a 7,600 and it boots fine on that. And I'm like, so what's even happening between two RDNA 3 GPUs? In One this of them setting? is monolithic. Mm. I've heard there are a lot of bugs in RDNA 3 that they've, I shouldn't say fixed in terms of like extracting the maximum performance they wanted to, but they've gotten it working. And it seems to be linked to moving data between the cache on the MCDs and the GCD. That's not on the 7600. 7600's monolithic. Doesn't have to deal with moving between caches on two different dies. So I that's could guess it's something to... I don't know why it would have to do with your issue, but yeah, that's a yeah. thing. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. But I guess I'm just saying that they might have had a problem that they didn't even... They might have had tested it on a specific line of Radeon GPUs, and then when it's getting closer to launch in QA, they notice that it's not working across, like, whatever, all RDNA 2, or a, a big subset, like the biggest mm-hmm. user set of RDNA 2 or 3 GPUs. And then they're like, let's just cut it until we can give it to all of them at once. Or... um since release, RDNA 3 hasn't gotten some massive on average performance boost uh, that I think a lot of people are hoping they'll be able to extract eventually. But what they have done in a lot of games is I think it just came out with like The Last of Us and Forza Horizon 5. Like there's like a 50% performance boost on the XTX and the latest drivers, and all of a sudden it's just up there with like the 4090. Who knows if they fixed something in the drivers that this game was doing a different way 
and then that borked the ray tracing. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's fully possible. It's it's interesting. There's a, there's a lot of possible options, but like from my experience, it seems like a lot of times I've I've met lots of AMD engineers and NVIDIA engineers and um, their software support and stuff. They're usually really nice people, and they're eager to reach out or hey, let's connect. And half of the time on the game devs, like with the smaller devs, I can't once again. Nix is a completely different story, but you you might just you'll get their contact. They'll be super w- willing, and you're just so mired in your next deadline, you don't get a chance to reach out mm-hmm. and then pull them in to actually do that layer of support that you were hoping to get for your product. And um, I, it's it's a combination of a lot of settings. Like all of these things are theoretically possible, and yeah, it would be really interesting to hear what specifically happened in this case. But I do think that we we underestimate sometimes that we assume that the difference because it's the same hardware we're talking to or very similar hardware that it should be easy. But sometimes just the abstraction layer, the API difference between the two is enough to make it uh, a completely different can of worms when you get around to looking at it. By the way, I agree. I think the engineers I've talked to at AMD and NVIDIA are always some of the nicest, easiest to talk to people I've ever met in my life. Not the same of the marketing people, but the engineers, uh, engineers, (laughs) Are yeah. very, very nice and easy yeah. to talk to. Yeah, exactly. Um, Gash writes in, Hi, Tom and Brian. Current GPUs have large last-level caches. Well, CPUs do as well now, uh, at least on the AMD side. He says, "Do well, Raptor Lake has a ton of cache too. He says, do developers have to do much to take advantage of these huge 96 megabyte caches on both the Lovelace 4090 and also on the uh, 7900 XTX, or do you just know they're there and they do their job? Well, to be fair, like a lot of times, cache changes are the IPC and cha- changes between right. generations. So, and you can, you can make specific, um, you can make things smaller. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's kind of weird because it would almost make you do less, not more, because... Typically, what you do is you, you're finding a bottleneck for whatever reason, and maybe you find something's way too big, and then you optimize those things to fit. And then that would be... So uh, it just takes advantage of the fact that you wouldn't need to do that as much with new hardware, or mm-hmm. it can do two operations simultaneously where you're only fitting one in before in the cache, or whatever. There's, there's lots of different things that could be happening in that space. I'm just kind of curious what... Um, well, and it, like weird things too, right? Because I remember like a talk from Naughty Dog, and this was, I think, for the PS3 version of The Last of Us, where they're really programming to the metal on that thing. And they said, you know, then we go through and we just want to have a steady 30 frames on the PS3. And we were just found in this one city street. For some reason, if we put the couch here, the frame rate is five frames lower. (laughs) If we move the couch or just remove this couch, is there enough cover here? I think there is. Let's just remove one couch and... (laughs) There was something exceeded where the issue just went away if they removed a couch. That's so funny. Yeah, it's it's the funny. There's so many bottlenecks in game development and PC development that come as soon as you exceed something, and you don't necessarily even scrutinize what it is. Sometimes you just simplify. Mm-hmm. So you're like, well, it was working fine yesterday. Why isn't it working good today? I did add fifty of these, twenty of these, thirty of these. Let's just remove until it runs again and then see how it goes or turn on fsr um but, if it's gpu bound yeah but no, but i mean yeah it's interesting too because um i i've the way i've usually explained it to people i mean obviously if it's a first party the optimization they will do is everything specific to what will benefit that console yeah. sometimes but usually if it's a third party developing for five different platforms the bonus you get for the console version is that they know the exact amount of RAM, the exact frequency. And so what they'll do is instead of just turning things from like low to high, there'll be like a medium and a half setting that they've created for the PS five. And they'll know that the medium and a half should have this much ray tracing and only this many, you know, flowers on screen. Like I think Assassin's Creed Valhalla, they said for some reason, the PS five, um, what is it? Uh, like the amount of plants, it was above ultra for PC for some reason in some areas, because whatever 
it could do it. <laughs> you know, well, the I think that one thing that you would have to factor into all of this is the level of diagnostic precision and profiling you get exactly. by sticking to one hardware. You can literally just record walking through the level and watch your resources, and that doesn't work for PC. You can, right. but it doesn't necessarily tell you the problem with every PC. It tells you the situation for that one PC. And with console, it's telling you something that you can fix exactly like what you're saying, where now you can be like, oh, we hit the memory too hard here, so we can just lower it. But it's just a bit too hard. So we yeah. only need to find those three textures along the path and drop them in resolution by this much. And now it's the right size and you get through and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Because I think sometimes PC gamers, or all gamers shouldn't say PC, think that the console optimization bonus is like some magical because it's a console 20 percent boost it's really not most of the time there is no real benefit it's just on pc ultras for this type of card highs for this and this and there's like 10 different vram amounts and ram amounts they're thinking about on console they're like you know if you set something oh my frame rate's not good on my 3060 i'll go to medium from high uh yeah i know the frame rate's okay but on Unlike a PS5, they don't need to go from medium to high. They might just go, actually, it's basically high. We just changed two things. And that's really the optimization bonus, usually on console. It's, it's not a magic 30% because it's programmed to the metal, usually. I, well, I think that this is, once again, the issue of the simplicity of the word optimization. I do sure. think you lose 20, somewhere between 20 and 40% of your hardware, depending on the situation, just based on the fact that you're not talking to it directly. But so the more directly you talk to it and then the like game ready drivers, that's for the game ready driver less scenario. Game ready drivers are basically hardware manufacturers trying to claw that back yeah. by manually adjusting by doing console optimizations for all of their cards. That's why yeah. the drivers of gigabyte are more too, because well, they have all these little things. They basically have game profiles or, or literally are overwriting sections of game code. They're doing all of these things in the driver to pull back that. So what you get in game ready drivers is really the attempt to claw back the 20 to 30, 40% they lose of just the fact that you can't talk to it directly and they can get some of it back. They can't get hundred percent of it back. And then some of it is exactly what you're talking about is that a lot of solutions optimization wise on PC are blanket solutions. Whereas on console, you can be really nuanced with to what level of scrutiny you do and where, because you have such much more precise profiling to hmm. the hardware. Ever get exhausted looking for a safe way to pay reasonable pricing for Microsoft software amongst tons of questionable listings on eBay and shady websites? Well, now you don't have to do this any longer. Not if you go to cdkeyoffer.com. This piece of content is brought to you by cdkeyoffer.com and their back to school sale. Whether it's Microsoft operating systems, office products, or even many of the latest AAA games, cdkeyoffer.com provides PC gamers with a product that I honestly think this community does need in a world where far too many of our components that make up our PCs are getting more expensive every year. The last thing we need is monopolistically priced software to remain on that list of stupid stuff we pay too much for. And you know, the Moore's Laws Dead team has been working with cdkeyoffer.com for many years for a reason. They've been good to me. They've been good to Dan. They've been good to family members that use their website when they build a PC. And they've been good to the Moore's Law is Dead community as well. So whether you're looking for Steam, EA, Uplay, or PlayStation keys, or of course Microsoft products, Support Moore's Law is Dead by using the code BROKENSILICON for 25% off all Microsoft products or Die Shrink for 3% off everything else. Support us at cdkeyoffer.com today. So Dave Schultz writes in and he says, Hey, Brian. Hey, Tom. Uh, and I know he's a developer. Uh, he says, many new releases have been lacking as of late, especially for Unreal Engine games, due to the game logic almost exclusively running on the game thread. As a developer mm. myself, it's extremely tricky to handle all logic and spread tasks over multiple threads trying to read and write data from or to a certain address in memory. Can you think of a future where all memory, especially L1, 2, and 3, is shared between all cores so that we won't have to bother with scheduling issues and race conditions any longer? 
optimizing a game for mini cores is extremely hard. So this might be a solution, or am I mistaken? Could this be a solution? Are there too many latency issues? Or is what I'm saying complete gibberish? Because I'm fairly new to multi-threading Unreal Engine 5 anyways. This is where I, I drop once during this entire talk every time we talk. I am an artist by trade, so just making sure that's known. So I, I talk to a lot of devs, but the thing is that the reason that caches work the way they do is that it's it is that core's specific resources. The L3 is the shared one, and then it has the I think the L2 and the L1 are exclusive to either a group of them or then lesser them, right? So the thing that we're talking about is like just in space, making that all interconnect would be probably a nightmare. So unless we found a way to make caches so much faster that it didn't matter, or mm -hmm we had a crazy breakthrough in interconnects so that we can have whatever, like if it's 3D stacked and it's a substrate right. underneath everything and then you could truly connect everything together, then I could maybe see a future. But that's that's a different type of Sense innovation. Oh, sorry, I had a cough. Yeah, it's, it's a different <laughs> type of... Um, yeah, it's a different type. It's a hardware innovation that would need to happen for that. It would solve a lot of problems. It would solve exactly kind of what you're describing that it's hard for threading is is difficult which is why a lot of times games run better when you turn off hyper threading because typically hyper threading is the way i always kind of explained hyper threading i mean a lot of you already know so i apologize of explaining some to people that already know it but i always think of it kind of like it's like an ice cream thing and you're trying to scoop as much ice cream as you can out of it but you can never get to the corners on the bottom. So you have another thread going through the bottom and then while it's scooping, it tries to grab more ice cream out of the sides. And that's the secondary thread on it in situations where you have, um, in situations where it's lightly loaded, you don't need a lot of ice cream. Yeah. You just scoop a little bit of the top. Then you can get a really powerful second thread going in there. In other things where you have like your main thread, there's almost no point in having another thread because you're scooping like 90%. What are you really going to do? You're just going to end up with weird resource contention by trying to go in and scooping out a little bit for something else. You end up slowing your game rather than speeding it up. So it's a matter of figuring out exactly how to, to balance what threading should be, right? Like... I guess I'm trying to figure out a way to word this. It's, you know, sometimes you find things like in your game that happen really fast and it's just causing enough of a performance issue that you can batch a lot of them together and you can put them onto one thread. And mm -hmm. then, and then maybe a hyper thread is useful because it's just not that heavy. You're like, I just need a little bit of power and I need it to not compete with anything else. And that's where hyper threading comes in super useful, but it's, Anyways, I, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I really need to describe with that, but I'm, I think that kind of gets to the thread because a lot of, a lot of times people just, I don't think we fully, I, we communicate often what hyper-threading actually is and what, mm -hmm. like how these CPU resources are, are being shared and what, what's actually happening there. Well, yeah, and, I, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I think ideally it's kind of like, well, you, well, I think the way you described it is perfect, but it's like also the reason you add it is like, not always all of the resources are being used. So yeah, that's exactly. why queuing up something else to so start using them before the cycle's done is smart. Like, that's what it's useful yeah, yeah, for. Yeah. But if you're not ever needing to use latent resources or to free up and let something else start using latent resources, then it, it doesn't benefit at all. And in fact, it can just get in the way. You yeah, know? and if, if you're not GPU, if you're not CPU bound at all, right? If whatever you're making your... MOBA game and it uses like five threads really consistently. There's no need to have hyper threading. There's no need to, it's like, it's, it's a, um, it's additional hardware at the outer limits of when things are already being utilized like crazy, where it could theoretically be more useful is uh, like when other things are running in the background, of your computer and they're competing for resources and stuff as well. Right? Like there's, well, it's there's like oh. when you see these tests of like, i7 6700K in recent games, they still seem to run pretty well. These quad cores with eight threads, if they're clocked really fast from Intel, yeah. even some of the older ones, still seem to be able to run the game. Now, if you turn off hyper-threading, the frame rate gets cut in half yeah. almost sometimes, which is like, whoa, I thought hyper-threading is only supposed to boost performance by 30%. And it's like, no, it was, it was actually filling in all of these holes because it only has four cores. But then you have people who talk about, well, I always turn out of hyper-threading, never helps gaming on my eight core. It's like, well, it doesn't help 
in the games you play right now because you have eight cores. But they it is there, and I'm sure it is making a difference sometimes, right? Yeah. And, and this mostly just applies to uh, Intel, by the way. Uh, most tests I've seen show that Zen, if you turn off hyperthreading, it's so built with keeping that enabled in mind that it actually doesn't seem to benefit you nearly as often as it does with Intel. To turn them off? Yeah. yeah. And, and to be honest, Intel's was pretty much, it depends how you look at it, so bad that it wasn't Intel Haswell that they said hyperthreading really was getting in the way least as as little often enough that it's definitely leave it on for all your games. Because there was an Ivy Bridge and before that, so many people were just, just turn off hyperthreading, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess it, it all it comes down to the game once again. What are they reaching for? Is there enough? Because hyperthreading is really useful when there isn't enough, and then you need more threads than what's currently there. Well, this is perfect, though. We kind of explain what hyperthreading does. Before I get to this question from Compressed Earth Blocks, he says, Hello, Tom and Brian. I was wondering, how do you guys feel about the removal of SMT and Arrow Lake? How will this ultimately affect game development? Will it make any differences for games within a reasonable time frame before being an irrelevant thing to worry about anyways? And I'll get to the second half of the repercussions of what I'm talking about in a second, because I actually have this new leak explaining some new Intel architecture soon. But I recently put out um, like an Arrow Lake Diamond Rapids overview that talked about how there was this Royal Core project, is this Royal Core project that was created by Jim Keller when he was working at Intel. Yeah. And there's a family of Royal Core projects. The first one coming out is Arrow Lake. The last one that should fully implement. So like Arrow Lake's Zen 1, Beast Lake and Nova Lake are Zen 3, right? Yeah. If that makes sense. But the thing is, Eventually, they're removing hyperthreading and replacing it with an entirely new core system. <laughs> yeah. Like they're this is they basically been iterating on the same design since like I think two thousand eight or six or something, and now they're they're kind of sweeping a lot of it out of the way and starting over like AMD did with Zen. So Arrow Lake was still kind of a bridge though, and it sounds like they wanted hyperthreading to work on that. And in fact, from what I hear, they wanted Panther Lake to use four way hyperthreading, but they it just kept competing with resources and eventually they said we're going to move to this thing called rentable units anyways let's remove it like we're going to get a massive performance increase with arrow lake uh and and from the sounds of it arrow lake is going to have p cores you know high performance cores that are 25 to 40 percent faster than raptor lake but they couldn't get hyper threading working they're not going to use hyper threading in the future so they're like well i guess we're removing it do you think that's going to be a big deal at any point, because first, Arrow Lake coming out is going to be eight big cores, no hyper threading with 16 little cores. And it sounds like they're going to follow up within half a year with the eight plus 32 core model uh, as the i9 or something. Mm. Do you think that's going to be a big issue, though? It's it's still going to be, you know, in multi threading 40% faster, but that's, of course, multi threading in Cinebench. Is it going to really? Well, that's the using the PND cores, and that's hard to compare. Where it's easy to send a parallelized task to all of them at once. It's not like a game yeah, where it's, it's like, so much of it is, is the cores communicating. Well, yeah, the, the CPU is not doing the rendering, right? In the same way it is when you use Cinebench, where it can break right. it down per pixel or pixel cluster. So, yeah, I think this is interesting. I think not having hyper threading is with current games, what's going to happen is my guess. So take it with whatever. Um, but I would guess that 5% of games are already going to have some kind of performance, not reaching maximum performance because of it. Right. And, but they'll look like an outlier at launch. So people aren't going to scrutinize it that much. And they'll be like, Oh, those are just 5% of games are weird with it rather than there's lacking hardware in this specific way and it affects games that we're already reaching for more resources. Within three years, it'll probably be 30 to 50% of games they're going to be reaching for those additional threads. That so like going 2027. To find That's yeah, exactly. the funny thing to think about is how far it is in the future. So Because Airlight comes out mid to late next year, next 2024. Because yeah. we're going to have to refresh this year, right? Yeah, and so you're, you're basically suggesting, I think this is something I theorized, I think we talked about this offline, like... I mean, most games really don't need more than eight threads to this day. So those are going to run like light speed. Yeah. And that's, say, 50%. And then 45% 
probably would have benefited from hyperthreading, but I mean, the cores are 40% faster, so... You're going to be gaining, gaining back the frame time in other anyways. ways, and then it, you won't notice. So even if you but had the same... there'll be a tiny sliver, like maybe in a real Engine 5.2 game, yeah, where yeah. it's like, why does this one only gain 10%? Yeah. More, who knows what it is, 20 instead of 40. And those, like I said, they'll look like outlier liars. And the problem with games across the board is when a game is an outlier, it is always treated as the problem, right? When yeah. hardware ships. And it's, I, you know, obviously I'm a game developer, so that would be where my bias lies, so I apologize for that in advance. But, you know, that's that's typically the case. If something happens with hardware, and then, especially when you already have other hardware out there, and the hardware, the, the compact competition doesn't have the same issue in certain ways or whatnot, like any of that stuff, then as soon as there's a problem, then they blame the game developers. But sometimes the game is just using more. Sometimes it, it whatever, if they make a big architecture change, I mean, look at... Uh, What's his name? Uh, Techia City has been going on a huge thing about 10th gen being snappier than 12th gen because they moved the one die off, right? Like this is, it's interesting, right? And I'm not, I'm not each gen of hardware is what it is. And the beauty of hardware is scrutinizing hardware. That's the fun with hardware is talking about where it's better, where it's worse, the differences, scrutinizing the little bits of it. Like I love hardware for hardware's sake. I've always loved looking into what hardware is and what it's doing. So to some extent, flaws expose a lot mm. in hardware. And that's where a lot of fun in, in conversation... But hardware is never perfect either, no. right? This is a trade-off. Arrow Lake is the first step into the Royal Core family. So do you not want them to take that step? And it's still going to be, even with hyper-threading removed, it sounds like, I don't know, 30% better at same core counts than Raptor Lake, and then the 8 plus 32 one will be 50% better in multi-threading, something like that. You know, that's still better than otherwise, and mm. there it's like when they removed AVX 512 from client Alder Lake, and they removed DLVR from Raptor Lake that is supposing their Raptor Lake refresh. They couldn't get it working for the release, but it was still way better than the previous gen. I want uh, or, this hardware or, now. Or, or, RD, or RDNA 3. RDNA 3 had issues. It is yeah. thirty to forty percent faster than RDNA two, though. Still, yeah. I, I like. I want this hardware now because we could start to figure out why. If we had more powerful CPUs and faster memory systems and whatever faster I/O, we could start to figure out what really is GPU bound in Unreal Five. And you know, like some mm. of these things, you need better hardware to even scrutinize. Yeah, because you're saying that that benchmark you sent me. Maybe if we threw it on Arrow, like, oh, it's gone. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. Exactly, right? Like, there's there's certain things that better hardware and hardware differences reveal, and it would be cool to actually have any of these parts in hand so that we could actually see where the problems are lying in engines, because sometimes we're blind to where the real problems are because we're so bottlenecked in a few places, but if you remove one of them, then it get, the picture gets a little bit clearer. Like X3D with Zen, where most of the time it's... Uh, 10 to 20 percent better then there's some games where it's like doubling the frame rate the vcash yeah. you know there was some specific bottleneck that this just solved right and, and that's what i kind of see happening by the way um because i want to clarify because i think you know a lot of people are going to hear us talking about arrow lake removing hyper threading being an issue where that issue comes from is in some games, if they program specifically for it i'm sure you can just move some of the tasks to the e cores but there's just a latency penalty moving a lot of it to the e-cores and it's one that we don't really see now because games don't really need more than 16 threads but if you remove hyper threading that's only eight that could be an issue it's still probably going to be faster than the last gen but you're saying well but Ze if zen 5 is just a consistent i think it's going to be like 25 percent performance boost or something 25 to 35 somewhere around there and then you add Vcash on top of that, it's totally plausible that what we'll see with Zen 5 versus Arrow Lake is half of games, Arrow Lake is 5 to 10% faster in gaming, but then in the other half, it's a tie, or Zen 5 just wins by 20%. Because, because it's ex exceeding resources with not having enough threads, yeah. Yeah, so I think that's just something to watch for there, but let me see here. So, all right, I, I want to move to the second half of this conversation here, because in that leak where I mentioned rentable units, all I knew at the time was they're called rentable units. I really didn't know anything else, but I really, really pushed people uh, today because I was like, I just want us to talk about what's going on. 
And I got a pretty decent explanation. So as a refresher, Arrow Lake removes hyperthreading. It doesn't use rentable units yet. Then Lunar Lake comes out as like an Ice Lake low power thing. Still no rentable units. Then Panther Lake has rentable units in mobile. It'll be like a Tiger Lake situation, I think. And then on desktop, Nova Lake will drop with rentable units. And so will Diamond Rapids. So it's like basically end of 2025 is when we'll actually finally see these architectures coming out with like the full evolution. And I'm just going to quote here from this guy at Intel. To be honest, I'm still wrapping my head around how this will work as well as projected by Jim Keller's Royal Core project. But Cougar Cove, which will be in 2025 Panther Lake, supposedly achieves a 40% IPC advantage with its rentable units over what the now canceled competing design would have achieved with Panther Cove in four-way hyperthreading. So just so put things in perspective, there was something called Panther Cove in Panther Lake that got axed. That had four-way hyperthreading in lieu of moving to rentable units early. And apparently, it's 40% higher IPC in some scenarios. Mm. And what rentable units seem to be doing is related to addressable logic in the cores in, with the units. The cores in Royal Core are being redesigned to be more compact, like a Zen 5 or Zen 4C core, like going for density, but then they're being organized, two of them at a time, into rentable units. So one rentable unit is two cores, with each core having allocation of SRAM independently, but sharing MLC per core. Then, of course, they've changed branch prediction, wider or deeper front end, to send tasks accordingly. And basically what this all means is the cores are now going to be grouped into two core units that take up less space because they share some resources but not others. But they're all cores, and in lightly threaded tasks, one of the cores in each rentable unit will be able to supposedly boost very high with extreme IPC. And then if they're loaded up, they can uh, supposedly delineate the task fast enough per rentable unit. So that's what's supposedly going on here. And I can see why hyperthreading completely messed with that idea. Because, well, now what thread per core in the rentable unit, you know, and it just simplified things, supposedly. It's making me think of several things, but it's all like wide speculation from me, right? It's well, that's what you're here for, for this episode, because that's what I want to do. I know, like, go on. Yeah. So when you first mentioned rentable units to me just in the message, and I watched your previous video, and I tried to figure out what I thought, my first guess was that it was some in, like increase in, um, I guess, just a, more of a heavier front end that would let them determine exactly how many threads a core needed so that a thread could essentially scale, a core could scale its threads. Because if something lightweight's coming where you want to actually utilize, like go wider with your core, it would give you the scrutiny to be able to do that where if it's a heavier task, it may be better for it to be able to transform into one core. And that was kind of the initial guess I had with rentable units. And It, it does- kind of sounds like that's what it's doing to a certain extent. Yeah, it sounds like what it's doing almost seems to be more of a mix with what AMD was doing with their mobile line and like being able to do micro clock adjustments to address these things. So if you have specific tasks come in, if you have more scrutiny, poor core, if the way that it's scheduled is more automated, then you have the ability to see the task and before the task, prepare the core's behavior to be ready for the task. That seems to be what rentable units sounds like to me, that it's an opportunity to, to choose whether a cord is essentially wider or uh, like mm-hmm. or higher clocked or all of these things. And it's done by just looking at whatever it is that's about to go in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Guessing I think, wildly. you know what? And I'm thinking back when I was at Hot Chips 2019, I actually managed to add a special event talk with Jim Keller while everyone was having beers for about 10 minutes. And I think, man, that guy can put him down, by the way, and you can't tell. that guy, I don't know what it is, but he yeah, he was like a bazillion drinks in and still just talking to 10 engineers at the same time. He truly is a genius. <laughs> I, of course, was like five drinks in, and I think I'm still pretty good, but it probably makes my memory a little more hazy. But I think I remember bringing up, like, wouldn't you eventually be trying to, like, combine a bunch of threads into a core or something isn't that what you eventually want to do is like if you could like i would like line them up so you're just you make turning things into a single core when needed and he said hey, why don't we just do it the other way and that was and that and i'm thinking back to that and thinking of rentable units and yeah it's like 
that's kind of what they're doing. It's interesting to think that he did drop a hint all the way back then. Yeah. Yeah. You might, uh, you might just gotten him in trouble for saying that. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yeah, I'm joking. But I, I, that's, there's a lot of things, but it does seem to be the future in general is increased, like, I guess, nuance and scheduling and more automated scheduling where more often what's going to happen is something's going to come in and it's going to know what resources because we're getting, and we need that for an ASIC world to some extent. When we start putting accelerators for specific things and all of these things, we need an ability to determine when things are, what, what they are, where they should go. So that's going to be more of the question. So it seems like we're getting a generation of cores that are being designed more with that in mind. Something's coming in. How do we prepare the system to be as fast? Where, where, what extra hardware do we have? How do we manage these resources? What do we split one way? What do we split the other way? And the more scrutiny they can apply to that, the faster they'll be able to make these things go. But it has to be really automated, and then you need a pretty heavy. You probably need a heavy front end, would be my guess. Yeah, you know, here's a question too. Um, I know for a fact that AMD has been trying to get four-way hyper-threading working for like. Well, since Zen 3, you know, <laughs> and they just keep kind of kicking it down the road. But I suspect they're going to get it working with Zen 6. And I coughed Zen 6 earlier when you were talking about streamlining cache uh, between different levels, which I also suspect Gen 6 has. Actually, I think I might just received a notification about it, well, we're, uh, like in an email, but, you know, I won't look at it now. But, like, how do you think about this future where perhaps Intel is going into this direction where they have these extra big cores that can kind of split into two cores if they need to do multi-threading, but they can go super fast when needed versus AMD just giving you that 10 to 20% IPC increase every gen, more cash now stacked under it maybe, and four-way hyper-threading. Like, how do you see that playing out potentially with, frankly, what will probably be what I just described in Zen 6 versus rentable units in Panther Lake and Nova Lake? I, I guess I'm seeing kind of like a convergence and also the intent changing in how they're designing these chips. I feel like the general thread, if I was trying to assess it, is they're expecting these chips to all need more scrutiny, but not to be applying it themselves. I think that this is probably coupled with what's going on with AI. This is just me guessing, but... I would assume that what they're expecting is that we're going to need more and more scrutiny in terms of how things are used resource-wise, but they're also expecting to have something more intelligent to the chip that's doing it for them as they're going into this so that we will be able to do this without developers specifically planning for it, specifically coding, or specifically trying to optimize for it. It'll be through whatever this AI engine is on the front of a chip that will... Mm determine it will be able to look really quickly at what everything is and then place it in its proper routes. And then these hardware designs that we're currently seeing that can't be utilized perfectly yet are kind of awaiting the software portion of this to be ready to do this. Mm -hmm. Well, so actually speaking on software, Zave Beto 3 writes and it says, greetings, Tom and Brian. With rentable units, do you think the game industry will struggle to adapt their current systems to this technology? Or will this just be something that the OS and everything deals with it on its own? I'm curious about the difficulties of switching to a new thread paradigm. Yeah, I, I definitely think that this will be... Like, once again, if this was in a console, I think I, then you probably would be finding people try to find ways to utilize it, like directly optimize for it because basically the way that i see this typically work in game development is you go until you hit a wall and then you look you look to go through those whatever those different optimization paths that i mentioned and the best optimization path you could typically take are the ones that look like free performance Mm -hmm. nothing's free performance but the ones that look like free performance are the best so if you didn't understand something specific about the hardware or if you're doing something in a way where you could do it another way and it's just faster those are the ones that always look free to the outside world when you do them properly and you would end up if you had a console you would have situations where developers run into a wall 
and their performance isn't particularly good. And then they're sifting for additional hardware. They realize the hardware is there. Then they utilize these rentable units when they, when, and then it becomes best practices. And when it becomes best practices, then it gets shared between different teams. Once one or two teams optimize it that way. And especially if they work with the same publisher, let's say they're all published by whatever, uh, I don't know, just pick a publisher. Like a third-party publisher, if they they were being published by them, they are in much more communication with the other games being developed by that publisher. So if one of them finds a solution for it, it mm-hmm. will be shared across that. And game devs are really friendly with each other. They're not that competitive with each other at events and whatnot. So if they someone comes to them with a problem, they're going to be like, oh, we fixed it this way. So mm-hmm. in scenarios where you have easy wins like that, they will share it, and it will gradually be covered. And if it's in hardware that is a big enough user base that's typically where it happens the risk is if it's not in big enough user base or if it doesn't end up being a big enough problem for people to look for those kind of things and in those cases it's going to rely entirely on whether or not we have access to it and whether it's a scheduler that's going to just handle all of this and then it gets to be on windows and everyone will point the finger at windows why didn't you schedule this better right yeah yeah i I, yeah they will and half the time they will definitely be right about that (laughs) Um, if not most of the time knowing windows. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just interesting to think like the only thing I can think of, and again, this is very much speculation because, um, even a lot of the people I talk to at Intel about it don't really know what it is yet. Like this is years away and truly some new stuff is they just, it, to me, I think they have to ideally solve the latency penalty between P cores and E cores to some degree, with Aerolake, frankly, already, they should mm-hmm. want to. But I heard one person say, uh, it looks like we're going to have some mitigations in place. And I'm like, that doesn't sound like you've solved it to me. That sounds like you have a way of trying to do that with either a thread director or Windows scheduling. Um, but they they really might need it, though, With by the time they are just... We're really just down to eight threads here for the big cores. And yes, they can go to like seven gigahertz with absurd IPC. But what happens if... So maybe it won't be an issue. Maybe it'll just be, it doesn't really matter. Like it'll just keep bouncing one main thread of this eight on like seven gigahertz. And then the rest will just do fine at whatever they're at splitting up the resources. I don't know. We're but, just finding things that are lightweight enough. That'll be done by the time that they're needed instead of, because I mean, latency is a problem, but if you queue it up early enough, you can get, something yeah. done at the same time, but you have to know it's really small. So you'd probably be t- taking advantage of like 20% or 30% of what a, an e-core is if theoretically capable of. But if you really needed the other th- thread and it was something really tiny that was going to be done on it, then that's an, an easy win. Yeah. So I, I imagine there's going to have to be something pretty soon. I should I say soon in about five years where games are like, there are four main threads and there are these other ones and they are not main threads. And they even look for the slowest thing to get out of the way of the main threads. But I think I talked to you about that and you said that's going to be really hard to do. Yeah. Well, especially if people are doing it manually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It doesn't seem like the, these kind of things, the most utilization that would come across from game developers is the most abstracted the less they have to think about it. So the more that Windows actually does build its schedulers so that it's taking advantage of these things in some kind of way. But we are coming into a weird future because, you know, some of the chips that you mentioned, it's mostly e-cores at this point in time. The differentiator Mm -hmm. between whatever the i7 and i9 is primarily e-cores at this point. So if you're you're neglecting 60% of your silicon or whatnot when you're playing games, then that's kind of a problem too. So we need to have a means to do these kind of things in the future. So I I can't imagine a future where we don't find a way to do it, but I do think that it's likely going to be a combination of improvements on Windows scheduling and combination of improvements in AI scheduling within CPUs, and that we're kind of laying the hardware foundation so that when we've developed the algorithms to sift through this stuff properly, the hardware is already there. That's my guess. Because yeah, I, I'm gonna guess just as well that Zen. I don't. I don't know about well. Some Zen five APUs will already do this, but you know, with like C cores and uh, non C cores with Zen, they're not really little cores. They're just other big cores that they've optimized for density behind the big cores that have more space to boost to a higher clock speed. So 
I, I would imagine it would make a ton of sense to me if Zen six had 12 core CCDs, but four of them were allowed to hit six gigahertz and the other eight were space optimized. So they take up the same space of an old Zen four, uh, Zen five CC that only has eight cores. That's my guess is an, a logical thing to do well, moving and then, forward with AMD. And that's also like, what should thread zero be, right? It should be yeah. your fastest core. And you know, they, all of these things. Right. So are, maybe there'll be an extra undense core on each CCD that is, well, you probably want two because of yields, but yeah. maybe two extra big, like, and then, like, I don't know, maybe four in the middle. And then behind that, you just put a bunch of super space optimized ones. <laughs> you really wouldn't have to change programming at all. They already just choose the fastest yeah, boosting right. core. So. Again, you see a solution where Intel's is looking at having a super elaborate thread rector and new software, and AMD's is like, well, if we just pin everything to clock speed and just density dictates that, we really don't need any new software. Yeah, well, there's that's an easier thing to sift through, right? So I guess on their end. So, I mean, these are it's smart. I like the fact that we're seeing so many different solutions to these problems because it makes the 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 way that we assess them much more interesting. Then when you see games behaving in different ways, when you see programs behaving in different ways and the architectures are so different, then it's actually amazing how similar they perform most of the time. Mm -hmm. So there's something really cool about seeing exactly where those differences, where the strengths lie, where the weaknesses lie. And we want, obviously we're talking about theoretical future hardware and like what tech yes city was looking at. They moved the one thing off of the die to fit, what was it? The uh, I don't even remember what it is. PCH, you mean on like a laptop die or? No, he was talking about how the 11th and 12th gen CPUs run Windows general operations slower, dragging things, moving things mm-hmm. because they moved the. Oh, this is I'm terrible for not remembering exactly what it was, but they moved one of the dies that typically is in the chip onto the main board, and oh, because okay. of that. Because of that, it is because like they did that too with like voltage regulators. Like they moved the voltage regulator, I believe, onto Haswell, and that caused it to get hotter. But it was also crazy efficient at low voltages. And then they've they've actually done that several times. Just moved it off, moved it back on. You know, like that's not what you're talking about. That's an example of why. No, they no, that. no, no. They moved like I think it's like the I/O controller or something like that. I don't know. They moved one component off of there, and it doesn't affect games almost at all. But it's odd that it affects things that oh. require like insane levels of scrutiny, like dragging files or whatnot, operations that happen with even lower latency than what a game typically does, because a game is trying to make a whole frame. So you would never be able to see any of the the differences in a game. But when you're talking about doing just regular desktop applications or dragging 400 files in, into your your timeline in Premiere or whatnot, those tasks are where it's noticeable. And that's I'm, I'm not saying this to rag on any individual process. I'm, I'm saying it because it's interesting because mm-hmm. they're aware of it, by the way, I've asked about this. I haven't really looked into, I haven't watched those tech yes city videos they're good, yet. They're good. I, I want to have them on soon. And that's, you know, and then I'll use that to freshly look at it. But uh, I did throw the links at some people at Intel and they were like, um, we're aware. Well, it's a hardware like, thing. They can't really fix it with this gen. They can have it back on the die when they have more die space on the, the next generations. And then, it's fixed again. And Arrow Lake and later, uh, because they're new, they're a new architecture. Are I'm told much more optimized for die space, like Zen is for the first time in a long time. So I'm going to guess they're probably going to do that with Arrow Lake or something. Probably. Yeah, I guess the only reason I really bring it up is because I just find these hardware differences fascinating. And even if it, it in the case of um, the 12th gen and 11th gen, in sorry, 12th gen and 13th gen in games, it made it was just wins. Left, right, mm-hmm. and center. There was no disadvantage to games, and for the most part, I mean, there may be one or two cases where there is, but for the most part, it's free wins in games. But it caused uh, latency issues in a lot of other places. And when you have hardware that does drastically different things, it exposes different things. And then it's it's hard in the PC space because, like, my favorite thing is talking about hardware agnostically, regardless of any of these factors. Mm-hmm. But when people have individual buy-in and ownership it makes it difficult to actually 
do that sometimes because when they've invested their money, they don't want to feel like they made the wrong decision or anything like that. That's perfectly valid. All of those things are very valid. And there's the the funny thing about this generation. It's not like you bought a bulldozer and you're defending it. Like this is all very good hardware. And then we're, we're scrutinizing the little nitpicky things about it, but just because hardware itself is fascinating and it behaves in different ways. And when we're speculating in future hardware, then we have to look at these are the changes and we know what things might be interesting based on what we've seen be interesting in the past. Hey, we did this, we moved this off of here, it adds latency. Then we think about, oh, they're doing this in the future, they're removing this, what's that going to do, right? They're adding this, though, what's that? And And on average, they'll probably be very close in performance, even though their design is not remotely the same. But if you're running only four threads, actually Intel wins. But if you're running 16, AMD wins. If you're running one, it's a tie. Like uh, <laughs> These are the types of weird things we're probably going to run into here. Yeah, if you're running beautiful. two, yeah. That's, those uh, are the best hardware differences. Like That's just, it's beautiful. It's interesting. It's fun stuff to, to dig into. But if everyone's getting a good product, then it's just, it's fun to speculate and compare between the two. So QH Freddy has a question about something that wouldn't be beautiful. He says, do you think there is a risk that smaller devs get left behind if accelerators become a major part of pushing forward the performance of games on PC? I would imagine switching to new computing paradigms would be an expensive undertaking in terms of cost to learn and understand how to use them. Hmm. Yeah. Because we've I mean, speculated before, like how AI engines could be used, and like, all right, but what if there's now this AI engine, that engine, that engine, that engine? Like, do you think that's going to hurt smaller devs, or do you think it really won't be an issue? Well, I think, like the beginning of the last talk, you talked about whether people were going to be more interested or less interested in hardware in the future. And we're already getting to the point where we're being abstracted from things so much that it's hard to know what's going on in everything. So it really depends. Um, it's, it's a good question. I'm just, small devs often do the best with small ideas for their game. Right. And then scale, or like a really interesting idea that they can play with in a a specific way. But if they're trying to match, then they would be resource limited. They wouldn't be able to pull off the same things. And that's always something we see. When smaller devs try to do things like big devs, there's, there's visible weaknesses. Hopefully they're just, they're bridgeable by people's perceptions, right? Like they're willing to let go. They know it's not that same team. They know Valheim isn't the last of us. They know these things. These are games that are trying or Factorio or whatnot. They, they know they're just different things and hopefully, but it does stop them from maybe moving up to new jobs, the more things. So Mm, if you have, they they didn't develop the experience. Yeah, exactly. So like you see this a lot with unity devs like devs that have been in unity for a very, very, very long time. And then, um, they like what happens is the skill set or a lot of the industries move to unreal. It's moved to custom engines It's moved to these things. And then when they try to get out of it, they, they have a hard time being able to apply for those jobs and whatnot, because their skill set's so tied to this other engine. And not that there's, there's anything particularly wrong with it. It's got different strengths and and downsides, but those are the scenarios where you're required. Other people are all learning things on the forefront and they're spending years not learning those things. Yeah. Cause like what I imagine with like indie devs is let's say there's like 10 different accelerators in Zen seven, if there is a Zen seven and, and in like beast Lake and I think a lot of indie devs, it's like, well, I can use Unreal Engine 4 and kind of make a game almost photorealistic anyways, because it's a simpler idea. And the hardware is so strong, it's just not a factor. And then you'll have some indie devs that like one of them's obsessed with AI engines and notices a trick he can do to make a new game. And then that's what he's good at. And then maybe he gets hired by a bigger studio because that's the thing he's good at programming. Then another dev is just good at the more general stuff. There may be some people in the middle that are left behind, but I think either the concept's going to be simple enough or they're going to find a trick to do with one of the accelerators and it really won't be an issue, I, even I, if, I would think. Even if indie devs had someone on their team suddenly become really good with this, like right now there's a huge tech artist. Um, like Tech artists can get a job pretty much anywhere. Because they're so in demand. It, it's such a new field that 
there isn't as many people taught in it. There isn't as many people out there that are good at it. And also big engine people like Unreal or like Epic Games and that anytime one of them gets five years experience in tech art, they basically have another job somewhere that's paying them a ridiculous amount of money. Yeah. So, and that's what's happening with, with tech artists and, and engine techs across the board is a lot of them, if they get good and it doesn't matter if they're in an indie studio or what they're being offered jobs, other places, because that's I know very... someone that is a VFX artist that went from, uh, I think actually from Treyarch, to Sony Santa Monica to Infinity Ward. And it's like the more experience this person gets, if they're the best at making good explosions and making them optimized, I mean, they're always going to need more explosions. Yeah. Well, if you're good with uh, like any kind of shader graph workflows, like using blueprints on Unreal or whatnot, like that is. <laughs> that's gold right now in the game industry. I'd, like I've, I've had a lot of people tell me, you know, what do I do if I get a job? I'm like, if you pick conventional routes, it's going to be hard. If mm. you pick, if you pick something that there's a lot of need for, that's hard to learn. That's really easy. So, and this is kind of the risk with things like this. When you have new hardware, new ways to do this, it creates a new niche that makes it hard for small developers to keep and pay that talent at that level and then you have you know the surplus so you can yeah. end up with situations like that that are a bit hard to maintain as games get more complicated in specific ways that you need people but initially if we did uh, like what it, what uh, qh freddy's talking about there it, you, games would already be running so well that it wouldn't be necessary it's really usually that turning point where you need more hardware than what you have and then the resource contention gets so high that these people become absolutely like rock stars and gold to, to have and why they'd be so desirable. And then places. they always leave a small studio eventually because, I mean, it's four times the pay or something, you know, or like that. Something like uh, that. Um, Beefish writes in and says, Hi, Tom and Brian. I work in data science, so it comes up for us, but I know that AI is a hot topic in game development right now as well. What are some things you think AI would really help with in development and some areas where you think it is going to be a waste of time and it's all hype and not really going to be useful for that? Mm. I like that last question. I like those. Yeah. I mean, things that way. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely areas where the AI is it's, it's so contentious and i know people are so positive or so negative you get people on both sides pretty extremely i try to look at it as fairly as i can right like when i this question came up the question of ai at an animation roundtable at gdc and animators aren't as scared about this as other people are because mm -hmm. for them right their work already takes so long and it still doesn't look perfectly real yet so they're hoping ai can help them cause cross completely the uncanny valley because yes, it can help smooth the edges yeah help smooth the edges where ai is currently really useful is in areas where there is lots and lots of material available and that material is small so when you have things that are like why text and jpegs fell the fastest it's mm -hmm. because both of them are like millions it is billions of files available on both of these things and they take no time at all to right. come through the big problem ai has in the future and this is going to push for an even uh, exponentially manifold increase in performance that we're currently seeing is th like abstractions in space so my wife was playing around with chat gpt to try to just as a joke, because she makes her own custom crochet amigurumis and was trying to figure out how to do, she knows how to do a pattern for it herself, but she wanted to see what ChatGPT would come up with. And it was nonsense, but it's abstracting three spaces, right? Yeah. So it's, it, it, in theory, has to be assessing a 3D model of whatever character she's asking it to do. And then it has to translate that into a pattern. So it has to scan it, break it down, know what crochet, crochet is necessary, and then communicate it and translate it. And it's these abstraction and spaces that are, are causing problems. When it has to be in one space, go into another space, that's where you would need way more computational power. Because now it's not just guessing or or making an algorithm based on what someone said before and what was acceptable it has to understand a three-dimensional space and then put into another two-dimensional space and then put it into another two-dimensional space before you get that information across and that's where it's really useless currently i'm not saying it won't be well 
Well, yeah, and that's something me and you talked about a lot offline because I was trying to use some of these online um, AI things for to ma- help me make thumbnails. And at this point, um, you recommended, um, what is it? Mid-Journey. Uh, Mid-Journey, which works so much better yeah. than the other crap online. Um, and it's still really not useful for most things, I'm going to be honest. Um, most of the time, it is faster for me to Google Jensen Wang laughing. Clip it. Person's arm. Clip it. 4090. Clip it. And I'll arrange it myself. But there are certain backgrounds and types of things I've been using where it's like, ah, that's a picture of a cougar. I'll take that. You know? But, ma'am, if I tell that cougar to be made out of glass, nope. Well, <laughs> it's just going to have glass appear everywhere. Uh, Majority like, does that sometimes pretty well. but Sometimes, it's... but man, I've struggled with it. Typically, the way that like all of these AI things go is the more common the requests are, the more aggregated, yeah, uh, the more aggregated um, positive responses are on something, the easier it is. And because you're existing in such niche spaces, yep. right, it's harder for you to get proper prompt, uh, like just there to be enough of what it's assessed to give you information. And we've like the main thing that we've found to use. AI for isn't the art itself. It's for um, like design team people needing, able, needing to be able to communicate to other teams faster and generating images so that concepts can be made of them later. You because, know what your idea is. Your final work will look way better, but this gets the idea across. Yeah, well, it's, it just narrows it down so they could be more concrete or they could be more specific in what it is. But as soon as you get to something very specific, like, oh, crazy sideways ice explosion, this. It's going to completely fall apart. Jensen Wang frowning. Man, the demented pictures I saw. It, it was hilarious. I've seen some scary stuff already happening with AI. Oh, I in, know. In terms of like individual people having their work fed into private, like stable diffusion servers generating work that looks 80% like their work and then being laid off in other countries. I've seen stuff like this happening with some artists. I've heard from artists in mm. China and whatnot that used to be paid ridiculous amounts of money to do work because they were the best. And now they're being passed AI images to polish and being paid a quarter of what they used to be paid. Like you see stuff like this happening. That's it's, it's going to be contentious. The biggest problem with all of this though, is that it's going to, individuals looking to get millions of dollars for themselves are going to collapse tens of million dollar industries over and over again Mm -hmm. as these things go. And we've been on an exponential curve of progress our entire lives. All of us, our our generation has been, you know, we've created jobs that are made irrelevant before that job actually really got fully utilized. Look at social media managers on whatever, like, that job didn't exist 10 years ago and it's already likely to be replaced by AI in a very short window of time. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. That's a good way. That's a good example. And it's, and it's interesting to see like people keep saying to like kids in college, just get good at learning and learning new skills because you're just going to have to be used to jumping between companies. And you're saying, yeah, because the companies may be putting each other out of business every 10 years. Like, and you just need to be ready to jump to the next one. So uh, a really close friend of mine, her, uh, her, uh, I guess her partner, they, he just finished his master's. And in his master's in engineering, there was a bunch of people that were working on this AI-powered thing that would go through arteries and would clear blockages and stints and all of these things. And already it was doing preposterously good at these things. And then you have to think, well, first of all, the biggest problem with a lot of this is it's not the people doing it that are being helped by other people doing it. It's someone else seeing someone else's skill set as a problem they would like to solve and then trying yeah. to to do that. There's no doctor that was asking these engineers to do this for them. And then you can you can make really strange assumptions from what this looks like in the future. You could be like, what does this mean? Is it going to be illegal for doctors to perform operations in the future? Because what happens is this does it with 95% accuracy and no complications and doctors do it at 70% and then someone does it and then there's an incident and they lose their spouse or whatnot and then they sue because they didn't use an AI and you oh, get these yeah. you get to get these weird situations coming soon and heaven forbid we put this stuff in the money system because it's going to break money fast 
Mm. So that's that's wild speculation. I don't know. And there's going to be plateaus. And the biggest plateau is coming from abstraction of spaces, right? Because anything that was existing in one plane has gone very fast. And you've seen the exponential curve, and then it flattens on the top of that exponential curve when it has to understand more than one space at a time. Oh, yeah, I see your point. Like, oh, everything can scale with this. It does. Uh, well we need to figure out how to do something else at the same time now for this to scale anymore. And there's just this plateau for decades and then it goes up again. Well, look at uh, like, for instance, 2d images falling. First of all, 2d images kind of reveal everything about what went into making that art. Right. Mm. And then you have so much data, so many people interacting with it and all these people's preference on it. So it's like the easiest thing to feed into AI. It's funny because people thought that would be like the hardest thing for AI to do, but it turned out to be the easiest because what we do the most, what we care about the most has the most aggregated content, yeah. which, which makes it the easiest thing to actually fall to AI because we just have so much data for it to do. But the problems all come from ab- ab- abstraction of space. So when you think of like trying to do it for something in animation, it gets harder because now what it's, it's no longer studying what is a picture and making a picture. It's understanding that lines of code existing in whatever, some 3d software, but it's trying to understand it through some video playback of something else. So now we have all of these factors trying to understand what that is translated from that space into whatever space actually Maya or unreal or whatever operates in and it's going to be much slower to do that and require way more processing power because it's first of all as soon as you're talking videos we're talking about gigabytes instead of kilobytes right and hours instead of seconds and then the order of magnitude of hardware that's going to be required is going to be much greater so we're going to see not that these things won't fall too they will but those are where the plateaus will lie the plateaus will lie when you have something and then there's some type of abstraction of space between that and the next plateau Mm-hmm. Well, so Call Addict writes and he says, Hi, Brian. Hollywood is currently struggling with writers and actors striking, but how is the gaming industry affected by it? As 3D and VFX artists are now uh, overabundant and with no union of their own, they appear to be the most exploited, always working at crunch time. Is there hope that artists and programmers reunite, unionize as well? And I like to throw into this a large part of the strikes in Hollywood right now are because of AI. In fact, I remember when the writer's strikes first happened and then I heard actors were striking too, I thought, oh, well, maybe it's to end this sooner because they can't make shows if people aren't writing for them. And then I re- and then I was told, Dan told me in an offline talk, no, apparently like what happened is <laughs> the writers were like, we want in our contracts. You can't just feed our writing into AI algorithms and then fire us. And also, you should probably worry about that with actors as well. There's a new Black Mirror episode actually about that. Um, feeding people and like manip- like making versions of people for a show without their consent. Um, and apparently the executives doubled down and said, no, we want this to be something we can do. And they're like, well, we're... And then once the actors heard that, they went, oh, well, we're striking now too. And so it's all kind of coming from we want rights so you can't do this with our work. Why wouldn't that eventually happen as a strike in game development? This is, I I posed a question very similar to this. So there's a story. When I was at the GDC Animation Roundtable, I espoused some of my thoughts on what's going on with AI. Because I see it across all spectrums. And I'm spectrums, and I'm weird in that I interact with it in so many spaces. Because I do 2D art, I do pixel art, I do 3D animation, I do, I've done, I've created 3D environments, I've messed around in all these spaces of art directed teams of people doing all of these things. And the, I've seen what falls fast, I've seen what people are less at risk. And the biggest thing I've seen is that one of the hardest things that people don't understand is we're messing with human motivation structures in a way that are going to be very complicated moving forward. And people that have achieved a skill always underestimate what it took for them to earn that skill Mm. in the first place. They forget what did this. You know, I I've worked with artists that I look at their work and I'd be like in five or six years, you'd be a great concept artist, but you really have to put in hard time. And I've watched AI murder their morale outright Mm. murder their morale they're being humiliated by a program and by people with expressions on their faces like i'm wielding your skill set like a rocket launcher because prior to this you would have someone if they needed something they needed an artist to resolve that they needed a writer to resolve that and now that person goes 
they get this goofy smile on their face where they generated a portrait of themselves doing this or doing this and this, and they're wielding someone else's skill set like this. And there's this weirdness that comes with that. And the other thing is, is you get this divide, like what you're talking about here with the production staff, between the producers and managers that would love for things mm. to be more efficient. Oh, I wish, wish we could do this faster. I wish it was more efficient or this or that. And then you have the artists and creatives and the writers and all of these other people in a project. Games take five years to figure out what they should be. Mm. First of all, is there not enough media present? Is the I, question I post. That's something is, Dan says all the time. Do we really need endless shit that's 80 percent as good as what we have now don't you just want everything to be perfect don't we have enough to watch we don't need a new show for five years frankly you know well it's exactly it like do we need and and developers need five years to figure out what a game should be i'm sorry like they don't know what the beginning and usually they don't there's very rarely that i've seen unless it's a sequel or something that they just stick to their guns from the beginning and they get it out the door almost always they halo want the infinite end. and returnal started as battle royales <laughs> yeah. and then they said and they said never mind <laughs> you know yeah. and then both games came out with high reviews as entirely different concepts than what they started yeah, a hundred percent. This is, it, it's very hard. And we are very, like, the thing is, is that currently, like with the lawsuits and stuff that are going to be happening, there's, the, we're in a weird period because we just exposed all of people's creative power to these machines. I mm. guarantee a lot of the pixel art that I've done in the past has been fed into some AI algorithm by someone that I don't know the, over and over again to feed these machines. Right. And I, the thing is that I didn't ask them to do that. And there's this, this weirdness that comes into where the rights lie in all of this. And I'm trying to be as understanding of all sides of this as possible, not come with a complete bias. No, we Which should just shut it down. Understandably hard because it really affects you like, well, yeah, more yeah. than most people. It does, right? I see like the democratization of democratization. That's it. Of people's skill sets can be useful, and some people may have beautiful ideas that they've never been able to realize. And we may see some Mm. ideas come into fruition in the world through this means when there were skill sets that were inaccessible or financial reasons that were inaccessible from them reaching that. There may be some cases where that is positive, possible, and this is a positive thing. But what we're going to see right now is there's going to be lawsuits. There's a chance that they might have to dump their data sets for mid-journey for all of these things because it's all been trained on stuff that wasn't necessarily given permission to be trained on. But then what's going to happen is the countries that don't abide by this are going to just end up having some version of this that obscures the fact that they were doing this in the first place and everyone's just going to be sending it. So we're sending business there. And then what happens Mm. across the board is we're sacrificing potential human potentiality in exchange for mass output. And the question will be, well, which system will win? Like, let's just, um, I'll use the example because uh, it's not exactly a thriving economy right now, and I don't think that's controversial. Uh, Russia, like, let's say they start having game devs that just do this. Will it actually be better than an American, Western, or Japanese game dev who isn't allowed to do this? Or they'll just be, because they're already kind of starting from a lower point, just a lot of crap using AI algorithms. Will it really compete? You know well, what I mean? It's it's not. I'm not worried about it not competing. I'm worried about the next generation building the motivation to instill it because the, 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 the blind spot we're going to create right now is that artists using these tools will wield them with the knowledge that they gained from the process of getting good at it. So we have artists that, because I'll tell you, the way I think, the way I perceive things and talk all change the deeper into art I got. The more Mm -hmm. I understand the world, the more I understand how it's composed, color, lighting, composition, behaviors, mannerisms, all of these things across people has changed how I perceive things. When I, or someone else that has even greater skills than me, wields AI, right, they might be able to create absolutely amazing results faster while they're still, because it's their sensibilities that's building it. Their skill set is what they put the time in, but they put time into themselves. They've instilled all those things into themselves, and then they can wield that outright. The problem is robbing the next generation from building those things into building themselves. Building those, yeah. 
And then what does that mean? Because we might end up with a 30-year gap where it doesn't seem like there's any downside. And then we look at that mm. next generation. And then when all the people retire, we're like, why did everything fall apart? Why did all of this content get way worse? It's because the people that understood what they were wielding. Have you seen the movie Idiocracy? No, I haven't. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's kind of become a cult classic. Um, it's it's a kind of a mid-level, mid production movie from i think early 2000s or something where it's just a, it's supposed to be a stupid comedy but the guy falls asleep or something and he's like and I, I forgot how he gets transported to the future like some probably frozen or something stupid and then he wakes up and he's an average level intelligence person like a hundred years from now and he's actually the smartest man on earth now because no one really knows why computers do what they do. They just know to press this button and it like turns into this world where like all funding went into making screens thinner and like boner pills and no one actually like and, and, and fixing baldness in men and none of it really went into anything useful. Yeah. And over time, they don't know why the computer, they're like, the computer is saying we have no monies anymore at the company. What happened with the stock? Like it's gotten to a point where no one remembers how anything works. Well, so something like that. Our generation is going to be weird for this too, because when we die, we're the ones that saw like the entire technological curve. I remember mm. pre-internet, I remember yeah. pre-computer, I remember computer, I remember building every generation of computer, and I, you know, I, I think I said this in one of the other podcasts, but when 2003, when Metroid Prime came out, you could play the original Metroid if you had linked the Game Boy Advance and Metroid Fusion, and I would play Metroid 1 for, like, 10 minutes before I played Metroid Prime, and it'd be like, that was 15 years. It seems like two centuries in terms of how far everything yeah. else developed. Like, and we went through all of that, and our minds have gone through that entire path, understanding the transitions between each of those spaces, understanding the exponential curve, engaging in it. So the experts of our generation have kind of, they've, they've seen the small changes, they've seen the huge changes, they've been in it all. But then what happens when we've, oh, those generations are dead and people, and it might be they that They don't it's know fine. how to improve it because they don't even really know how it works. Yeah, I mean... You know, it, like, here's an example, like, of one thing where, yeah, I remember the era before the internet, obviously, like, in video games, um, I couldn't look up how to solve it. There were just some games where I just couldn't figure out where to go next. <laughs> and eventually I did. And it took me eight hours or days because I couldn't Google it, you know. But one thing I never really had to figure out, I, I never, because even when I got my driver's license, I still kind of knew how to get around my town. I never really needed to know how to use highways and directions. And there's been time where like my phone dies or something and I'm like, ah, what do I do? How do I get there? <laughs> and then I will, I'll be driving and I'll look and I'll, I'll say Bloomington, Illinois that way. Mm. Oh, oh, oh. So it's already pretty self-explanatory which way I need to go on the highway. I really don't need Google maps all the time. Yeah. Unless like, there's obstructions or other things, but you're saying like what, but you know, that's like an example where I almost don't know what to do, but I think, could figure it out. How many of these things will people do that? But these are like skills that are seven years of development. Like, will they know what to do next with things that they can't just think of in five seconds? I've already caught myself discouraging, not discouraging, but actively not encouraging young people from becoming artists. And that's a sad thing for me to say. Mm. I've caught myself doing that where other artists typically the way that it works in art as far as this is the way i explain it to everyone is there's this line like this and if you're below that line there's no work and as mm. soon as you cross that line of skill the world opens up to you in terms of work and then the oh. higher you are up the more work that is possible for it's you the same with architects i've heard too where like out of college, the unemployment rate is insane with architects. But then if you're one of the best architects, you're making millions a year. It's because, well, do you make the house cool enough? Yes yeah. or no? You know, like it's such a difference. But those are artists too. Yeah, well, that's exactly. It's a, it's a type of artist. But there's a skill point. And then typically what I've done in the past is I see people that are learning art really fast or that I can see that they're just under that line. And I encourage them like crazy. I just... I'm like, hey, like, well, whatever, do you want to learn something? You know, I'll tell them whatever they want to learn about art. I'll go into nitty gritty specifics about form, structure, lighting, whatever. And then, but I've, I've caught myself since the AI boom being way more reluctant because, you know, 50, 60 years ago, 
you did education for a vocation or you did something like that, and you would expect to be able to work at most of your lifespan. It's only with innovations like this, because yes, you know, you can compare it to the industrial revolution. You can compare it to these other periods of time where we had major changes. But if you learned one of those new things, you're going to work that till you die. We, on the other hand, are on the exponential curve of change. So instead of big changes where you have to learn things new and you can carry those out for a while, it's always new changes on the curve. And then we have to be adjusting over and over and over again with our skill set. And there's a certain point where our human potential will lag behind what the, what rate things are actually changing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, Samuel Park writes and he says, as of now, we see a lot of online art communities pushing back on the advancements of AI art. Most artists do not like their art being used for training without permission, and they're trying to use various tools to prevent it from being used for that purpose. Purpose. However, to me, this is similar to the plight of anti-cheat versus cheaters. The tools that work to stop AI art are going to be playing catch-up to the models that will quickly be trained to surpass such hurdles. Do you think online art communities have any chance at stopping AI art, or are they shit out of luck and will have to accept the fact that any digital art post online is going to be used for training? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I touched on this already. It's going to be used for training. Countries, individual countries... And this is going to get to be more of a global issue than anything else. There's going to be countries that do have to dump their data sets by law, and there's countries that won't. This is most likely going to happen. And then we have to determine what to do from there, because we can't tell every country in the world to stop doing this. There's nothing that's going to stop China from generating all of this or other countries that that just choose not to have it, because to them, that's just mass output. They're getting free money by being able to do this. They're having a technological advantage. So it's, it's really... And the thing that's going to be exactly kind of what I've been talking about as far as I'm concerned, I'm worried more about human potentiality than I'm worried about individuals. I'm not, I could lose my jobs, whatever jobs I've had in the past from things like this. I guarantee that I definitely could. As as I became more of an art director, less so, because it's more important that I'm managing and interacting Mm. with lots of people doing these things. And that is harder to replace than just someone's outright output. But... You know, everyone's going to be facing this particular risk. and But for me, particularly, I, I whatever, I obsess with tech. I obsess with this. I, I've taught uh, college classes for the last four years in art. Mm. I have pivotal directions. Like, I can pivot if I really need to, if I was stressed in different ways. But it's much harder for people that haven't instilled all of these things. And it's the same thing. It's like, I'm worried about the next generation. I, I, I really don't think... What's going to happen is is if we do dump the data sets, that's the worst case scenario for us. We don't dump the data sets, and then we're just going to keep going the way that we do. We do dump the data sets, and then we'll probably just license those data sets from other countries <laughs> to use right. them anyways. And then it's just some obscured way that stops us from doing this. I don't necessarily see a way other than analog processes from us completely being able to to stop these things it's like it's going to continue happening there's there's nothing we can do about it as far as i'm concerned right so if there's some way to have this debate now which a lot of people are saying we need to probably the way that would benefit your society most though is still coming up with a system where look, there's nothing we can do to stop some countries from just letting it iterate to infinitum but they might not learn the skills they need to to really know how to use it the most effectively we yeah. need to make sure Whatever we do, we're making the engine of like actual understanding and innovation not going away so that even if we're licensing it from other countries, the people in these countries actually have the manager managerial roles. Right. Yeah. You know, we, we, that ends up with the same kind of talent differentiation that we already have. I mean, you see yep. this with um, just divergent versus convergent thinking across the board in countries that favor one versus the other have no innovation or too much innovation or, you know, or not enough production. You, you see this kind of these systems at play. I just, yeah, I think this is going to be really interesting case and we're not going to know the full ramifications from all of these things until multiple years until it plays out for a long period of time. You know, the funny thing is I did a little bit of an AI rant at that animation talk and then this guy comes and sits down in front of me and he's like, I want to talk to you more about what you have to say about AI. And I'm like, who's this? He's an art director on Bioware. (laughs) 
I just thought it was funny, right? Like everyone's so affected by this. And the thing is, is that you end up with, with what you're describing is, yeah, we could be the ones managing it, but we're also people doing jobs they hate more. So when you see this a little bit with animation, with motion capture, animators love to animate freely most of the time. And when you pull a lot of mocap into your pipeline, they turn into cleanup artists all of a sudden. So we've mm. turned the love and their passion of their skill set into a mundane process in their skill set. And there's a lot of risk to, to take the love and motivational factors away from people with all of this. That's interesting because I think I'm the opposite. I like lists and the concept and then making it happen at the end. I actually don't like the middle that much, but I'm not maybe as much of like what you would describe as an artist, you know? Yeah, well, it, there's a big difference between that. Like the whole production is your piece in that regards, right? But with animation, mm -hmm. it's like, what did you... And I guess there's a certain amount of what you can take credit for in the mix of it. If you know that you hand animated an entire sequence, it's yours, Right, and if someone points to it, they're pointing to you. If it's just mocap cleanup or something like that, it, it's something diminishes how much yeah. ownership you have of something like that, and 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 also your ability to prove your excellence. That's another thing that diminishes. Hey, I'm really great at this, right? Where there's more of an equalization of the product. Yes, there are much better mocap cleaning artists than some other ones, but it's not the difference between hand animating showing the quality of an animator. Right. There's to some extent, you know, it's diminishing the people's ability to show off. Anyways, like there's there's so many facets that come into play with stuff like this. And, you know, it seems like AI's plateaued a little bit for now. And I think it has to do with that abstraction of spaces and having to understand more spaces at once. But I don't know, this is gonna be a big problem across the board, no matter what we do from here on out. King Arkinian writes in and asks, how will AI art be used by the pros? Will it be mostly enhancements with the artist doing the drawing, then they'll request coloring, detailing, adding effects to the AI? Or should it feed an AI with an art style and get it pumping out fully constructed assets? Well, the final one's what a lot of them will do. But I'm wondering how much of it you think it will be, though, there may be a new art that, evol that evolves into... Well, it's what you're going to do is draw the skeleton of the concept feed it in, take it out, and then finish it, but you're still drawing the skeleton. Like, obviously, there will be some people that don't do any of that and just wanted to pump out the whole thing for them. But do you think that could become a thing that develops, though? Yes, to everything that you said. It's all part of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, all of this is part of it. You're going to have people that use it as a skeleton. You're going to have people that use it outright. You're going to have... Uh, the big thing, the thing that I think it, that's beneficial about it is it frees up... Um, a lot of concept artist time mm. in the sense that, and sometimes in bad ways, sometimes in good ways, because now every little idea that comes through the entire team's head doesn't necessarily have to. It's the hyper important stuff. I learned, I'll admit, like outright playing with AI, my art got way better, even if AI wasn't included in the product. Because same with me with my thumbnails. I, immediately, my thumbnails have been getting better recently, even if I didn't use. Uh, open journey and it, or mid journey. It turned yeah. out that it like the things is, is that you might notice that humans are aggregation machines. The problem with AI is it's perfect aggregation machines, Yeah, right? There's a beauty to the imperfection of how humans aggregate. We take specific influences and we take them wrong. We don't necessarily take it as it actually was, or it actually happened or actually remember it's, it's a mixture. It's like, you do something with an inspiration or an ebb or a little tiny bit of something else, and then you push that. And then we do this beautiful mishmash, horrible, wonderful aggregations. And that's what's special about human aggregation. And the problem with AI is that it's perfect aggregation machines to better and worse. It's going to make the most average work to some extent because the, most, the best mm. painted average work it's going to be absolutely gorgeously done because it's not discriminating based on technique. It's more that it's the aggregation of all of these things. And when we put uh, prompts into it, we're just limiting it. All we're doing is putting limiters on mass aggregation to try to create a specific result. And, you know, the things that I learned, I, so I've, I've done images for, for work where I've just used it as texture, Right. I'll, I'll generate some images and mm. then I'll just, so I don't have to spend eight hours painting six trees. 
yeah. for things like that. You just you cut them out. You throw right, them in and that image. stuff is a godsend, you know. Well, I actually found there's a big thing that happens in concept art called photobombing, right? And a lot of concept artists take photos. They just Google search, put photos, they take them in their image. And I never did that because I felt guilty doing it because some person owns that photograph. That was like my personal take on it. I have nothing against them, the people that do that. It's just my moral qualms with it. But I did feel less qualms doing it with AI. Mm -hmm. because that layer of abstraction of already being everyone aggregated instead of some one specific person's photo. But it did show me just doing, you know, like a year of it, it taught me a little bit more about contrast, a little bit more about uh, some last flaws in my work. And then I've stopped using it almost entirely for the last five months. And my work has been better than ever without using it. But I have to admit that I did learn something from using it and seeing all artists aggregated on whatever idea I put in. So there's strength in terms of, there's theoretical strength in terms of um, being able to perceive the aggregate outcome, output, but I don't know if a younger artist would be able to take the same things right. from it that I did, right? And I also don't, I, I've known other artists that are really opposed to doing this, and then they might be left behind. And the other thing that I've noticed I've seen this across lots of friends is, and a lot of creatives that I know is that since the AI boom, the expectation of the time it takes to do art is Mm. dropping. So there is a secret you're taking too long that no one's speaking. That's getting more and more aggressive. And it makes the individual that asked for a request for it feel like, well, I could have generated it by now. Right. And I've found personally, and I know it's not ill will, it's something else happening. I don't want to read conscious processes into this. It's just what happens when you give someone a tool like that. And then it feels like, you know, they have a a jackhammer and you're using a hammer. That's what it feels like in that setting. And then that stops it because before you might have two, four or five days to do like a major piece of key art. And now it feels like with a lot of other artists that I talk about where they're like, well, you have a day and deal with it because. Right. And this is my concern, especially on the, the Hollywood side of it, which I I don't see really why it would be any different than game studios though, where I think a lot of people at the top of some of these Hollywood studios are looking at this and going, I think this script sounds just as, you know, maybe directors wouldn't say this, maybe the best producers wouldn't say this, but a lot of the producers out there might go, this script seems just as good as that other script. I can't tell the difference. Yeah, you can't, because you're not the artist, but these artists know that this script sucks compared to the dialogue in this one, you know, by like Soderbergh or something. And that's why that one is beloved by millions of people. And the, the worry I would have is, how many decision makers can see that sparkle? A lot of them can. A lot of producers, you'll see a director say, that producer really knew what the real thing was in this movie we were making. But there's a lot that are just churning out action bullshit. And is the bullshit going to become even bigger bullshit? Because the people at top can't tell the difference between what's special or not. That that's And we don't need more content, too. So then it's just even more bullshit we don't need. Well, it's just yeah, it's my they have the option of not paying someone to make that specific thing. And, you know, the funny thing is, is once again, it's the next generation and whatnot, because there are directors that started making what you call as bullshit movies that eventually made something wonderful, but sure. they got their start doing something less. And those, those are the scenarios I'm most worried about. It's, but even still, like, Unless you're in the depths of madness in a specific skill set, and it doesn't matter what it is, then you cannot typically, most people cannot articulate what it is that makes that last 40, 30% of whatever went into something special. It's not... It's, That's it's, my point too, right? Is it's like they might go, well, this didn't cost me anything, but it's 80% as good. Well, number one, it's not. It's half as good. Number two, trust me, if you just make 10 things that are half as good, it'll make less money than two things that are great because we don't have all the time in the world to watch everything anyways. I don't need to watch... There's so many shows people recommend to me where I'm like, I don't need a me- another mediocre show. That's why I'm not watching it. It's not that I think it's a bad show. Yeah. There's just too much to watch. I'm going to wait for this one thing from HBO or something. Well, and the magic of something, like sometimes it is genuinely the last 20 or 30% of something that makes it feel different. Exactly. Like the way that it feels to actually interact with whatever that content is feels different because of that 
that last 20, 30 percent scrutiny, you can't even put your finger on. And even if they try to formulate it into a formula for the next game or movie or whatnot, it doesn't land the next time because now it's been made into some kind of pro, like just a process that they thought will just hit these notes that was like this and this. So <laughs> the Marvel Cinematic Universe times a hundred. <laughs> what? And that's what it people- just turns into a factory. And that's with the the people already being beautiful, I know. beautiful uh, uh, aggregation, beautifully flawed aggregation machines, already mixing it up enough by accident along the way, right? And then I think that the the big danger in this is that you could end up with much more identical content, mm-hmm. for sure. But that's when I wonder, right? But what will really happen? Will we have a bunch of identical? Co- there will be this rough period, but will there still just be people doing things the artisanal way? And because it's five percent different, people actually paid attention to that one. Yeah, I don't, it, I don't, I don't know. Probably not for some of it, but for some of it, I suspect so. And it's possible that it's going to, you know, fragment the market. It's hard to say for video games because it's all already existing in spaces that are so similar to the AI space and all of that, like anything digital, it's already existing. And it's not like, you know, with chairs, yeah, you can buy a mass produced chair from wherever, or you can have a hand carpenter, you know, make an artisanal chair for you. It's like, that's genuinely a different product in a different space and a different kind of feel and reality is are like are artists going to refuse to be online and just go analog in their own towns and communities <laughs> like making uh you know that's that's kind of what's left to them and i don't know it's very tricky times there's so much there's been there's been times i've been very excited by what goes on ai there's been times my heart's literally sank through the floor in in what's going on with it and it's going to be it's going to be strange going forward. And once again, like this is with me not being worried for me, but like Mm -hmm. it is, it makes me less keen to draw with my kids still do it, but it makes me less engaged in it with the same way with like, you can do this. Oh, and you'll be able to do this when, you know, like I I've opened up that potential to, to a lot of individual people, um, just interest in art and being able to pursue these kind of things. And it, it hurts me to say that I doubt it enough that I'm, I'm approaching it with hesitancy and reluctance where I didn't used to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think if there's one thing that I think, you know, you look at when we, when the mankind went to the moon and it's like everyone back then thought, well, with all this technology, uh, we're going to be on Mars in 10 years and we'll be in Pluto in 20. And uh, no, we just wanted those TVs they had in our house that was make them smaller, make, make, make thinner TVs that are higher resolution. The stuff we did with what we got from out of some programs was not what we thought it was, you know, going huh. to end up being. And so I, I tend to lean towards there's going to be winners, losers, and good and bad things that come out of this. Um, but I am sympathetic to the opinion that this is different this time. And, uh, well, I think it's the rate of change. You really need to have these conversations and I would recommend we make some laws and if people are going to strike because you think it it will help do do it now, you know, before I have 10 of the exact same TV show to watch that all suck. Please don't, I have enough shows to watch too. Like, or you're literally cast in every one of the TV shows because now it's catering so much to you that you are now the character in all of these things. It's possible. Like the the realm of possibilities this opens up is interesting, but it's <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man, like you're right. If we have to if we're going to stand up and make some kind of like foot in the stand laws about this, it's now. And once again, it's it's not necessarily this individual change that I'm worried about. You have one pivot, people will deal with it. We'll find the best, the worst of it, and then we'll make do. And there'll be some strengths and there'll be some weaknesses. It's the exponential curve of pivots and progress that's going to leave more and more and more people behind. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, uh, I tried to end on a happy note there, but you <laughs> were able to bring it down. We can call one it another more. happy note. It's not such a big deal. No, no, no. I, th- I think that's, I think that's a good place to end on. And as usual, I try to not have us go for three hours. I thought I was going to get us to a round two on this one, right. but I think frankly, it's not the most flashy subject. Uh, cause it's not me just screaming new in video leak, which is, that's how you get all the clicks. But I think this AI part, although it went on longer than expected, is 
probably the best part of this podcast. And hopefully the people that stuck around this long uh, probably agree. Um, so whether it ended on a good note or not, I think that's the note I'm going to end it on, though. Um, but please plug your uh, plug your studio, plug yourself, tell people where they can find you, the work you make, the people you work with. Yeah. Um, so once again, like Google Brian Heemskirk, you'll find me pretty easy if you check me on, feel free to to message me on Twitter, all of that. Um, once again, my opinions are my own. So, uh, and I apologize if I say anything offensive or that didn't go with your sensibilities. Um, I just was excited to be on here and really enjoyed the conversation. Um, in terms of plugs, check out for a game. We should be announcing stuff on it soon. Hopefully it's something that some of you enjoy. I'm not typically the kind of person that pushes the game on people that wouldn't be interested, but if you find it genuinely interesting to you, I, I love people that enjoy games that I make to play that I'm not that kind of person that pushes people that maybe wouldn't enjoy it to play it. But that's, that's me personally in that. And Again, I, just far too humble. Just tell people to buy games you make. And well, then- I, <laughs> I want to, and I'm in Gamescom and Devcom in uh, August. So I would love to meet with other like-minded people, chat with like-minded people. Please feel, feel free to reach out on Twitter or message me or any of these things. Cause I'd love to have more conversations like this. And yeah, so that's really, I guess what I have to say, feel free to check out the studio and the game when we announce on that. And hopefully everyone finds it exciting. And, uh, all of your information will be in the description as well. So people can just scroll down there and click on that. But otherwise, thank you for, I will shamelessly shill. Please support Moore's Law is Dead on Patreon. You can get these podcasts early and ad-free. Bonus podcasts like Die Shrink, they're hours long, have no ads, and get access to the Discord to ask me questions for news episodes, guest episode, uh, guest questions, um, and th- there's really a bunch of other stuff. Otherwise, just please do that. Subscribe to uh, Moore's Law is Dead and Broken Silicon. And um, yeah, we went pretty late again, so I'm exhausted. Thank you everybody for listening or watching. This podcast was brought to you by the YouTube channel and website Moore's Law is Dead. Moore's Law is Dead and Broken Silicon are trademarks of their creator, Tom. That guy is me, and I am indeed the creator, editor, writer, and showrunner of Moore's Law is Dead podcast, videos, articles, and other media. However, it's not just me. Moore's Law is Dead is a team with Broken Silicon co-hosted by my brother Dan, audio editing by Gerard Cortez, renders being done by the industrial designer Jean-Philippe Clermont, and special assistance is also provided by Carmen Cry and Carrie Nosugad as well. Find all of our information at www.moreslawisdead.com on the about slash support page in the event you do want to hire me for consulting work, hire Gerard for audio work, hire Jean-Philippe for industrial design work, or you're interested in working with Carbon Cry or Kerry No Sugata as well. You can also find our long-term sponsors on that page if you want to show them some love for putting food on our tables. Or you can also mail us some love. You can send letters or hardware donations to the following address. Moore's Law is Dead, P.O. Box 60632 in Nashville, Tennessee, zip code 37206. Although, to be honest, the best way to show Moore's Law's Dead some love is to support us on Patreon. Patrons are what makes Moore's Law's Dead content truly possible. Every month, and really every day, depending on who you're talking about, me, Gerard, Dan, and John philippe are working tirelessly to provide a steady stream of content that we could not keep doing unless we knew the work was possible without being reliant on sponsors dictating every little thing we put out. Don't get us wrong, we love our sponsors, but we love directly working for you, our fans, much more. If you have any extra money, even a couple free dollars a month, consider supporting us directly on Patreon. Those couple of monthly dollars will get you access to the exclusive podcast Die Shrink, voting on subjects of future podcast episodes, the ability to ask guests questions, and of course, access to the Moore's Laws Dead Discord full of like-minded people who I am sure would love to meet you. I am one of them. Additionally, higher tiers get access to early, ad-free episodes of Broken Silicon, the ability to ask questions in all Broken Silicon episodes and loose ends live streams ahead of the recording, and the entire back catalog of Moore's Law is Dead podcasts, in addition to having thanks in the credits of videos and podcasts depending on the tier with other perks available as well. And hey... 
If you cannot afford to support us directly every month, please do share Moore's Law is Dead videos and podcasts with friends and family and on social media and websites like Reddit. And give Broken Silicon a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast app of choice. All of this does really help us so much. But like I said, this podcast would not be possible without it. the patrons directly providing predictable and reliable support every month. And so now it is time to give a personal thanks to the greatest of the fans. The following supporters are at the 10 gigahertz or higher supported levels. Brad Medlin, Drita Foles, Z Jits, Daniel D, Aaron Close, Jan Rauner, Daniel Hyde, Brian Ringelman, Sam Miller, MJB1, Deke, Jeezy Ziggy, SNES Chalmers, JM Ferriera, Andrew S, Falcon Malev, General Drips, Jensen Wang, Nathan Mose, Eric Jackson, Sarcastro, Evan Dingle, Gray Guanchek, Chris Rich, Nicholas Buckner, Benjamin Cannon, Jonathan, Jesse Jeskowiak, 3DS Boy 08, Hal Buma, Blake, Hardforum.com, Franco Frederick, Shredbird, Dr. Foreman, Jake Dude 23, Jake Martin, Zicky, Ricky Tan, Chris Frey Butler, Stephen Hart, Meat and Pork, Stu, Tim Robb, Ian Clifford, Trevor. Travis Gooding, Nan Nan, Sammy Malas, Deepest Learners, Mad, Zutsu Taylor, Stephen Coates, Michael McGee, Greg, Patrick Gross, Stefan, Jordan Simkovic, Amy Will Chief, Win Wang, Tommy, Mark Mitchell, Julian Leaked, I Should, Mark Rainmaker, The Boss, Haas, James Anderson, Cole Attic, Judson N, Cameron, Wesley Sager, Henry Zhang, Michelle Pell, D31337, Antics, Roger Davies, Cameron, Hexapuma, Chrysantine, Meyer Tech Rants, Reginald Ari, Teak Autumn, Jackson Miller, Gregory S. Acker, Neith Rezink, The Eternal Dreamers, JSMMH, Jamin Since Reagan, Jeff Settler, AWS Dan, Loophole 35, Windstar, James I, Raider, Corey Leonard, Little Germany, Shea, Milton, Post Media, Dave Schultz, Mac Daffy, Stephen Dick, Chuck Glennon, Brett Jones, Austin Haggerty, Dustin Bustle, I 711700K, Joe Foot, Harlan, Lushboss, C2, Jansen Angima, Joseph Kelly, Samuel Park, Keith Moore, Himsa Gung, Tails 2299, Brian Wright, John, Siphos, Earth Taurus, The Forbidden Juice, Fenty CZ, Kiko Sato, Toka, RB Racer, Me, Val Verga, AC, Colin Tadards, Lord Starstream, Michael Cozy, Dr. J Mad, Alex Vega, Free D, John Swin, Rodent BC, Terminal Junkie, Brian Wright, Jed Baldwin, Joe La Martina, Kikum, Elber Gun, Solarized 80, Christopher Ricks, Jamie Whitworth, and of course, thank you to Sahara for the music.